One of my goals has always been to bring science and the paranormal together. Paranormal is just science undiscovered or misunderstood. Every time I keep asking how good can it get, this prompts the participatory universe to provide us with answers that we genuinely do want to live the answer to. Hello, my name is Christopher Anetra. You know me as the quantum businessman. And I said, you know what? I don't need to know where I'm headed. I thought I knew where I was headed before and I didn't end up there. So why worry about where I'm headed? Why not just accept this now moment, trust that whatever guided me here with you guys that I feel is divine is going to continue to guide me. The content you are about to watch is meant for thought and consideration. Please be respectful of each other and opinions shared. This is a safe place to express thoughts, ideas, and information. Please note that no copyright infringement is intended with regards to inclusion of short excerpts of material that are included in accordance with fair use under Section 107 of the Copyright Act. IMEC or International Mandela Effect Conference is a 501c3 nonprofit organization designed to support ongoing Mandela Effect research. To learn more about IMEC, please go to imec.world. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the International Mandela Effect Conference. Uh, I am Jerry Hicks, also known as the Dark Wolf. It is an honor and a pleasure to be with you folks today. And of course, I'm not the only one. I've got an amazing team that I will be bringing on right now, ladies and gentlemen. First and foremost, we have Cynthia Sue Larson of RealityShifters.com. <laughs> Hello, Cynthia. Hi, good to see you, Jerry. Good, good to, to be see here. you. It's always a pleasure to get together with you guys. Next up, we have Shane Robinson of Unbiased and On the Fence. How you doing, Shane? Doing wonderful. Welcome, everyone. Glad to see you, my friend. And last but not least, we have Christopher Anitra, uh, the, you know him as the Quantum Businessman. How you doing, Mr. Chris? Good, and welcome all you lucid dreamers. Glad to have you here, sir. So we have a heck of a show today. It's always great to have this team together as it's always an amazing time. Today we're going to be talking about signs in the sun, moon, and stars. How are they connected to the Mandela effect? Really, really jam-packed episode full of information today, folks. We got to move quickly uh next slide please huge shout out to our amazing producer in the background heather she does an incredible Ooh. job shout out to you uh show agenda this month's mandanimal sponsor we only have one so he's gonna pop up at the top there uh board member updates after that followed by the april 8th solar eclipse and the ponds brook Ooh. Comet. That ought to be an interesting discussion. Uh, then it'll be followed up by the lunar eclipse, moon rusting, Corona Borealis Nova event, a whole lot of information in a very short amount of time. And then obelisks again. You guys remember we discussed obelisks a year or two ago. What are they doing back in the news? That's interesting. SAR arcs and Aurora curls. What in the world mm. is that? Are we on a new earth, folks? We may very well be. Black history changes, name changes. What's going on with Black History Month? There's been some weird oddities. Mm. Uh, black watermelons, interesting, mm. ladies and gentlemen. Custard apples, pop-off fruit, pineal, gland size, liver and kidney location changes. There's so many different mm. Mandela effects mm. this month. It's insane. State capital quiz spiral aloe and aloe trees number 10 time traveling professors uh some of you in the research realm may be familiar with this particular story uh followed by extraterrestrial life in the thermosphere ladies and gentlemen here's a story you're not going to believe uh, if it didn't come from scientists i wouldn't believe it and i still question anyway uh <laughs> Data from Star Trek, eyes turning blue. So data, the character from Star Trek or data from Star Trek? We'll find out in a moment. Mailbag and mm. Q&A to top it all off. We've got 13 mm. agenda items, a number that will come up again in the show that mm. I can guarantee. 
So, folks, as I said, we've got a lot to do and a little time to do it in. So, first off, we have our first sponsor, the DeWinton's Golden Mole. A golden mole. We keep seeing these golden animals in the timeline. And I just, I, I love it. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, I'm not as big a fan of the gold as I am the Lazarus. Everybody knows I've got a soft spot for those. But just <laughs> the same. Love the golden animals. Uh, this thing swims in the sand. Has been found mm-hmm. in South Africa more than 80 years after the species was lost to science. So 80 years has come back. It's a Lazarus too. Mm-hmm. It's a Lazarus golden animal. Chris, what have you found <laughs> me here, my friend? I love this. The critically endangered DeWinton's golden mole was rediscovered by a team of conservationists and geneticists Mm. from the Endangered Wildlife Trust and the University of Pretoria. It is 11th of the world's most sought after lost species to be rediscovered since the global wildlife conservation search began in 2017. A Lazarus golden animal, folks. What do you guys think about this? I think it's a coincidence or meaningful coincidence that we're seeing that year 2017, which just caught my attention now, that they've been looking for these missing species since about the time people around the world really started noticing that Mandela effect happening globally. So I don't think that's just a meaningless coincidence. I think it's quite meaningful, you know, that the search for... Lazarus species began right when the Mandela effect came out. To me, these go together. So, yeah, I, I want to mention too. It swims in the sand. <laughs> Does that remind you of a popular movie that's just come out? Dune. Yeah. <laughs> Dune. Exactly, and Dune Two is now in the movie theaters. It like mm-hmm. did all these box office highs mm-hmm. and so mm-hmm. forth. So, swimming in the sand, the whole Dune concept. They showed the moon there, like a smiling moon. Um, yeah. there's a, there's a, it's, they have these like warring houses or families. One is on a planet that orbits mm-hmm. a black sun. And then everyone on that planet sees everything in black and white because of the black sun, you know? So there's all these contrasts and similar and more similarities mm-hmm. you can pull from what's going on with this. Mm-hmm. So as soon as I saw it, it's a mole that swims in the sand. It's like, Oh, it's one of those giant <laughs> worms from, from Dune, but <laughs> Yeah, I want to bring in the chat. Rose made the comment. Comment. He's kind of beautiful for a mole. I agree. <laughs> Boiling Frog says, "Love the Lazarus returning." Yeah. Awesome. Thank you guys for chiming in. And yeah. Cynthia brings a good point. It's something that I noticed a uh, a lot in the very beginning when we started looking into this. Is there is a ton and a ton of Lazarus animals that have been coming back in the last couple few years. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Cool. And the golden ones are like remarkable as well when they come back. And the amount of golden ones we found that that's been an incredibly high number too. At one point we put out three separate videos, I do believe or four, something like that with different animals, like different categories of animals we found. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm going to just draw like one more similarity to the movie Dune. So those those giant worms on Dune, they all sense vibration. That's how they're able to know if there's someone walking on the sand or so forth. A lot of people think that moles are blind, but they actually have eyes. They have small eyes and they can sense light and dark, but they primarily work by vibration. So as they're swimming in the sand, they can know what's going on around them. And we don't know what the distance is from all their from their vibratory senses so i just wanted to add that into the mix too i think in the in the book dune they were thumping to get the the worms to come Uh, and in real life i've got a gopher in the front yard Um, i saw the first gopher of spring the other day (laughs) i mean that cracks me up but he he surfaced his little head popped up and he does come because he knows that i care about the gophers so he's my friend i'm not poisoning or trapping him which may sound weird, but he conditions the soil and he's a little gardener and he brings plants into the garden. So I'm always happy to see him. <laughs> Not golden, though. No. He's brown. <laughs> Not, Not yet. yet. Not yet. <laughs> right. They're hard little cool. workers, though. You should look up golden gophers and I bet you won't pop up. <laughs> <laughs> Rose says, I wonder if there are any golden polar bears. I'm not sure if we've had that or not. Not yet, but 
Coming Not soon. I, I'll be honest. Right. I can't keep up. We've had so many. <laughs> so that is, ladies and gentlemen, the DeWinton's Golden Mole. There you go. Our sponsor for this month's International Mandela Effect Conference Open Tables. Next up, we have the IMEC board member updates, starting with the one, the only, the reality shifter herself. <laughs> <laughs> Cynthia Sue Larson, how has your month been, Cynthia? It's been action-packed and lots of good stuff in the newsletter, the Reality Shifters newsletter. I'll just say that so people can check it out. But I think the biggest event that happened was just the weirdness when I was talking about UFOs on my video, which was about uh, connecting the dots. And so I was sharing about the disclosure and, and actually covering some of the material in Paula Harris's excellent book. Okay, so what happened that was weird in the video, it sounded fine to me. I did a little audio test after I finished the video, taping it outside. It was fine. I uploaded it to YouTube, and then I started noticing in the comments people saying, I can't hear the sound. There's no sound. You know, is there any sound? What happened to it? Okay, so long story short, I, someone contacted me and said, I can fix that. I'm a professor of audio, and you know, no problem. Would you like it fixed? I said, yes, please. Okay, but that's not the really interesting part. The really interesting part is that also in the comments, people were telling me and emailing me, Charles Eisenstein just did his video, his State of the World Address, in the section about UFOs. Um, the audience, it's like three different things happened to people, not just one thing, but some people heard the whole audio properly. Some people heard sort of a scrambled or weird version and then some people um, didn't hear it at all. It was like the, the whole UFO section was missing. And it's like, whoa. And that's exactly the kind of stuff Paula Harris writes about in her book about the UFO experience. And so there it is happening concurrently pretty much at the same time in a video that Charles Eisenstein did and then one that I did. And so it seems like it's a consciousness effect, clearly, um, if, if you want my opinion on it, like what's going on? And we get into this discussion of disclosure. Is it happening? Yeah, it's happening. And there's a lot to it. Apparently, you might say that uh, it's helping us more readily see that there are different possibilities of reality just happening real time. So that was pretty cool. That is wild. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> did anyone here have any issues listening to it or did anybody have a chance to catch it? Oh, you mean in the in our live stream chat? Yeah, that would be great to hear if anyone was tuning into the state of the world that Charles Eisenstein was presenting. I didn't listen to that live, so I didn't get to hear that. And from my own video, it sounded fine to me, but a lot of people couldn't hear it. It's like we're on we're starting to see the world split, you know, in real time. Rose says this happens to Whitley Strieber regularly on his interviews. Yeah. Hashtag ET interfering. That that explains so much because when I interviewed Whitley, um, I had problems and he saved the day. It's like we used his equipment, his system, because mine was not. He, he was so used to it. He's like, oh, we'll just switch over. It's like it was. He just water off a duck. <laughs> like, <laughs> I said, thank you, thank you. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It's pretty funny. That is wild. I've never had that particular incident, but it doesn't surprise me. And it's not the first time I've heard of uh, interference, if you will. If you remember the movie, The Fifth Kind, um, that was interesting about the Alaska um, uh, psychiatrist. I didn't see that. Oh, it's based on a true story. As a matter of fact, at one point it shows like real life, film footage opposed to the the hollywooded version of a ufo over the house like it's but wow. the aliens are aware that she's interacting with a uh, abductee mm. subject and they're trying to get her to stop she keeps getting closer and closer to truth to the point that they actually abduct one of her children and mm. never bring them back like it, it's a crazy movie but there's interference mm. all through where you can notice they're interfering different ways mm. in her life it's it's just it's really odd. Once again, as you say, Strieber has had it. It's it's a well known yes. thing yes. in the ufology phenomenon. So oh yes, very fascinating that you had that happen to you, Cynthia. <clears throat> yeah, it's fascinating. All right, <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Well, part of it was I was talking about some of the stuff that I had experienced. Uh, Chris said, welcome lucid dreamers. And I had lucid dreaming experiences with ETs and UFOs. And I was talking about that for the first time on my channel, which I'd never talked about before. So, and, you know, just feeling like, okay, it's time. I can start discussing some of this. It's very interesting. And I think it affects all of us in a good way. So it's positive, but interesting anyway. It's like, are we ready for this full disclosure? It seems like part of our collective consciousness says yes. And part of it just wants to keep things going the way they've been going. Let's not look at that stuff. Very interesting. Anything else going on this month in Reality Shifters or the magazine or anything? Oh, gosh, all kinds of stuff. Um, but we have a loaded show today, so I don't want to... I mean, right. I, I, some of this... I, I think, know you usually give a little quick update. Okay, with it, yeah, so. yeah. Okay, one quick one. One of the weirdest ones, it's from India. I heard that there's a um, something very strange is happening where a mold, a fungus that used to be found in caves is now a spice and a seasoning. And it's never been a mold that's found in caves. This came to me from a contributor in Lucknow, India, in the Pradesh um, area. And basically, the, the, it used to be a mold found in caves, and it's spelled anaphotida, A-N-A-F-O-E-T-I-D-A. And a lot of people do remember, it was not a spice, it was not a seasoning. It's not something that you add to foods to bring out a certain flavor. It was totally just a cave fungus. So that was kind of, one. I think that was the weirdest thing from the last month. Any Anna Petita on your fajita there, Jerry? <laughs> <laughs> Not that I know of. Uh, pretty trippy. <laughs> that's fascinating, though. That's definitely an interesting one. So there you go. RealityShifters.com, ladies and gentlemen. Link is in the chat here. Also should be underneath the video on the replay if you're watching on replay. Next up, we have Christopher Anatra. Our Anitra, you know him as the quantum businessman. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, we're going to talk about that at the end. Like, how do you pronounce my last name? Is it Anatra or is it Anitra? Which one is it? So, yeah, we'll get that. We'll get to that at the end. But, um, yeah, so there's always something going on with me. So, um, so many Mandela effects in the reality. Um, I'm working on two new videos. Um, one is actually synchronistic because uh, Cynthia Sue sent me an email about the same topic I'm working on it's about how you make a divine I am presence statement. Yes. Yeah. So a lot of people don't know what a divine I am presence statement is. There's a certain format it's supposed to be in with an opening and a specific closing. And who are you talking to when you make this statement? Who is the divine I am presence statement? Making sure that you're communicating with your, your purest source possible or your creator or whatever you want to, to view that. And why would you want to do it? Because it gives you authority in within this hologram, within, within, yeah, within this reality to create. It's like it shows that you've reached a certain level of your frequency where you can start talking to the higher being that's actually dreaming you in this dream. So there, there's that. And I'm working on another video I'm calling the Mannheim Effect, which is from an episode of Star Trek that mm -hmm. one of my viewers sent me where you can where they started to observe actual time slips. So, so right now we talk about timelines and that type of thing and, you know, these Mandela effects. Mm -hmm. But what if something happened to you where you go downstairs, like you have a morning routine, you go downstairs to your kitchen and you, you're preparing whatever you do. And then all of a sudden you look up and you see yourself walking down the stairs going into the kitchen. So these types of time slip events, is it possible that these type of things will happen to us? It's almost like an amplified Mandela effect. So I get into that concept and how that works as well. So we've got, we've got a lot of things going on. It's all really cool. I can't wait to see those videos. And those are going to be on your YouTube channel? Yeah, I haven't even filmed them yet. So it probably won't be until late April, early May. But yeah, it's, it's the, some of the projects I'm working on now. And yeah. this is the uh, Symphony of Realities, right? Yeah, and the Symphony of Realities. Absolutely. Yes. Perfect. Yep. And they can also find your work at quantumbusinessman.com. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yes. Excellent. Yep. Ladies and gentlemen, quantumbusinessman.com. Link in the, the uh, chat over here, also down below. And Quantum Businessman on YouTube, correct? Yes. Excellent. You know him as the Quantum mm -hmm. Businessman, ladies and gentlemen, Christopher Anatra. Mm -hmm. Next up, last mm -hmm. but not least. Well, no, I'm last, aren't I? 
Next up, we have <laughs> Shane Robinson, unbiased and on the fence. How you doing, bud? Oh, man, I'm doing great. Uh, haven't done a lot on the channel as far as uh, putting content out. I've been doing a lot of one-on-ones, but I do plan on attending this upcoming solar eclipse and getting some footage from that. So nice. expect that. I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. I think this is going to be a huge event. And uh, I'm located in Oklahoma, so I'll be going down probably to Texas, depending on the weather. That's where it looks like right now. But uh, yeah, uh, I'm going to have a carload, actually probably two carloads of people that are just excited about this whole event. So hopefully I'll have plenty of footage to share on the channel with that, because I did cover it seven years ago. So uh, with that, you can uh, find me on my webpage at uotf.net. If you'd like to book a one-on-one -on -one session with me or just find out more information, all of my social media links are there, as well as links to my online stores and all of that good stuff. So that's kind of the one place you can find all of that. So thank you, guys. Oh, and thank you so much to Paul there in the chat. Thank you for the $49.99 uh, super chat there. Huge You're awesome. shout out. Thank you so much. Happy thank Equinox you. all, he says. Happy mm -hmm. Equinox all. And we will be discussing that as we go further into the show. So uh, I don't want to bring it up too early, but definitely happy Equinox to you to Consciousness Watch. And thank you once again for the $50 donation. And if you, ladies and gentlemen, would like to donate, remember, we are a charitable organization. That's right. We are an official 501c3 organization. What does that mean? That means that any donation that you make to us is tax a write-off, right? Uh, this is a donation like you would make to any charitable organization. So do save your receipts. You can write them off if that's what you uh, are able to do on your taxes. So everybody wins in the end. And you can always super chat us like you said. Paul was his name, Shane. I don't want to get it wrong. Yeah, exactly. Consciousness like Paul watch. Done here, Paul, yeah. Or you can uh, super sticker or if you really want to get some exclusive content, you can go over and join our Patreon, mm -hmm. ladies and gentlemen. Uh, very, very cheap. There's different tiers over there, I do believe. But all tiers are able to see the very special green room episodes that we do every month that are only available to our pa mm -hmm. Patreon members. So definitely something to check out over there, too. We appreciate all of the support we get from all of you guys around the world thank you so much shane i do apologize sir for that little commercial in the middle of your uh uh monthly update that is Anything it i was gonna pass it to you what about uh <laughs> what have you been up to my man hey excellent well we could not have timed that any better then huh uh <laughs> <laughs> thank you today's Paul. actually very 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 like busy day yes once again thank you uh as we've got uh the Link going into the chat here, the RippinRabbitHole.com. Today is a very special day over at Rippin Rabbit Hole. March 20th is the day that we build up to every single year. It is our big celebration day there. Um, we are not affiliated here at IMEC with any political party. Over there, I'm affiliated with the Republican Party. Uh, as it is the birthplace of the Republican Party, Rippin, Wisconsin. So we celebrate that with the Freedom Flame celebration every March 20th. So I will be doing that after this show later on this evening. If you guys are interested, check out RippinRabbitHole.com, R-I-P-O-N-R-A-B-B-I-T-H-O-L-E.com. Once again, I must reinstate that is no affiliation with IMEC whatsoever. I must be very, very clear on that. Uh, but that's what I'll be doing this evening. So I've got a bunch of shows. I'm going to be broadcasting probably for the next five to six, maybe even seven hours. So Drink uh, lots of coffee. <laughs> lots and lots of coffee. So this is I've a warm-up for you. Right <laughs> exactly. This is just the beginning. It's the exercise period right here. Uh, so a lot of, lot of online hosting today. I'm really, really glad to be here. It's always a pleasure to be hanging out with my favorite group of people. Uh, an amazing team to work with here at, at IMEC and amazing group of people out here in the chat. I, I can't, can't get over how incredible our community is. So um, I've been doing good. Well, you can always catch me every Wednesday and Thursday night over at rippinrabbithole.com. Uh, Wednesday night, of course, we discuss paranormal, including Mandela effect from time to time. Yeah. 
And the Thursday nights, we have a more political slant on our discussion. So uh, pending what you might be into, check us out over there. Once again, links in the description and underneath the video on replay. And Jerry, you're on Twitter. You're also on Facebook. So people can find you there too. I well, I'm on Facebook. I use them for advertising, but yeah, you can keep up with when the shows are going to be over on yeah. Facebook. Uh, I am on Twitter. I also do something called the Friday Surprise Show over on Twitter with uh, uh, a brother of mine, basically. Uh, so there's all kind of different podcasts I've got going on across the week. Check us out over on Twitter. Thanks, Cynthia. I totally forgot about Friday Surprise Show. <laughs> so much I do anymore hosting. There's so many shows I can't even keep up with. Right. Uh, so, yeah, again, that's more of a political comedy show over on Twitter. So uh, check us out Friday surprise show if you're into that. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. <laughs> I was just reading the chat there. Uh, thank you so very, very much for being here with us, folks. Uh, we've got to move on now to the rest of the show as we have a huge announcement. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, 2024 is the fourth annual. How you like that? How we were able to pull that off. 24 is the fourth annual International Mandela Effect Conference, the annual summit in Nashville, Tennessee, ladies and gentlemen. Mm -hmm. That's right. I am so very, very excited to be the boots on the ground, to be able to bring this to Nashville, uh, a place that I've known for a very, very long time in my life and a place that I'm excited to share with the entire world, the music capital of the world, ladies and gentlemen. Save the date, November 7th through the 10th. Uh, this is actually a throwback to the first conference, which was in... Uh, Sun Valley, Idaho, November 7th through the 10th. So we're getting back to our original date. Five years, five there. years ago. Yeah. Five years ago. So we had the one digital one, right, in 2020 because of yeah. the wackadoo of the world. And uh, <laughs> and uh, after that, we've been doing live in-person conferences. Uh, the tickets are going to be $185, so they haven't really went up any. That's for a full three-day experience, plus the meet and greet on the uh, uh, day prior to the starting of the conference. So actually, it's kind of a four-day experience, three-and-a-half day. Uh, so definitely a huge, huge event, guys. Great price. We will have those ticket sales available very, very soon. Cynthia, go ahead. Yeah, we'll be together in a hotel this time, so this will be really nice. You'll be able to see people at breakfast kind of hang out and be kind of in one place instead of all over. And that I'm looking forward to that. And we'll have a discount rate for the conference attendees as well. Absolutely. Yes, I have we have a discount rates worked out for rooms in that hotel. Absolutely nice. great prices. Uh, we'll get that as I say as you say moving forward. Uh, we'll have more information on that and how to book those rooms. Shane Chris, you want to add anything? <laughs> the silence. Well, I'm gonna take that as I was going to talk about right, the food that I was. I was excited about the food part, but I'll wait until we. Give out <laughs> but you'll love the food options. Let's just put it that way for now. Yeah, and I can only wonder what yeah. Mandela effects are going to be happening between now and then. I have a feeling there's going to be some some big ones. But yeah, yes. we're going to have to find out how many clocks are on the wall in this particular room, right? Yeah. <laughs> so we're hoping, oh, hope, we want. Well, yeah, we want people to come and help change, um, you know, choose the best timelines for everyone going forward. So we've jumped a lot of timelines. We had time travel kind of th theme going on last year. So who knows what will happen this year? It's going to be I amazing. Tell you, these events are absolutely magical. Yes. They, they really are. There's a feeling, there's a, a camaraderie there that is beyond anything you could ever imagine. Then again, I may just be happy to see my team in person. I'm not sure. I, I might be wrong on that, but everybody else tells me the same thing. So who knows? Yeah. Anyways, ladies and gentlemen, mark the date, November 7th through the 10th. We hope to see all of you guys there. Um, 
again, uh, we'll have more information on tickets, hotel rooms, all that stuff coming up very, very, very soon. And speaker application form. We'll have everything. Definitely there. speaker application forms. Um, before we head out or, or soon, I, I need to talk to the team also about something. So about an email we received right like moments before the show. Okay. So. <laughs> we have a busy uh, but, schedule for this show today, too. So let's. Oh, my goodness. Speaking of, let's roll on out to the next topic the april 8th solar eclipse so there's a lot going on with this thing i've heard so much i don't want to get into too many rumors so i'm going to go ahead and throw this down to chris your show chris yeah so basically you know everyone's aware of the whole x marks the spot concept where the two 2017 and 2024 eclipses um have that convergent point in southern illinois falls into a category, lots of different areas. One of the areas is called Shawnee National Forest down there, which is a national forest where um, there's this really unique rock formation called Garden of the Gods. It's a, it's a spot, spot too where many Sasquatches have been sighted, believe it or not. They actually have a sign out there like Sasquatch crossing, which is like a Sasquatch <laughs> family running across the road. So yeah, so there's a lot of talk about that. Some of the other slides we're going to get into we'll talk about that particular location and what might be happening there and then there's also the concept if you take the the other eclipse that happened in 2023 and you put them together you get the elf the aleph which is um the first letter of the hebrew alphabet and then the x or the tav is the last letter so the alpha and omega kind of concept so it's it's all super interesting um i had recently done a a podcast with someone named Sonia. She's from the Tree of Knowledge. And she had pointed out that 2017 to 2024 is seven years. And what happens to our body every seven years? Mm -hmm. Our cells regenerate. We, we literally have a new body. Mm -hmm. So could that also be a tie-in to a new future, a new start where X marks the spot? And then you've got all the X stuff going on. Like Elon Musk names his kid X. He's got SpaceX. Um, he changed the name of Twitter to X, which is confusing to me. He bought the whole brand. So why would you buy a brand and then change the name? It's like, it doesn't make any sense. So there's that whole X concept as well. And, you know, what, what does this all mean? I think in Elon's case, he had a longstanding desire to have that X set up. And then when he saw Twitter, it looked like perfect, you know, just buy something that's there already that's established. So... But I don't, it doesn't explain the fullness of it. <laughs> like why it still doesn't explain why was he so smitten with this whole X to begin with. It is a Roman numeral 10, as the slide points out. And there is something special about that. And then this um, tie-in with the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, that's pretty important too. So it does have a great deal of symbolic importance and significance. And carrying on with the same conversation, next slide. There's another significant thing happening on this day, Chris. Is that correct? Yeah, there's going to be two broods of cicadas that are supposed to be emerging right around April 8th. And guess where they're primarily located? In southern oh, Illinois. No way. <laughs> yeah. What they, yeah. What are the odds? crazy. Yeah. Brood. Right where the X is going to mark the spot up, right? Yeah, and they, they call they call these different broods, they have X's in the title. So one is brood thir 13, which is known as XII, and the other one's brood 19, which is XIX. So now you've got more X's involved. You know, is there a significance with these cicadas coming out at the same time? Because it's very rare, they say, for two broods to come out at the same time. And a while ago, I think in season one even, maybe season two, we talked about the white cicada that was that were being found in thailand i believe right but mm -hmm. i always thought cicadas only come, came out every 17 years yeah. As it turns out there are all these different broods some mm -hmm. come out every year some come out 13 years some come out 17 like wow. so there's That's a lot going on with the cicadas and the special kind of like mm -hmm. literally light language mm -hmm. they produce because they have that very unique tone and frequency um so yeah, will they be communicating something to us through the through the sound of their um, through those like chirping noises that they make? 
Um, I just wanted to point out real interesting that uh, when you're in the path of totality, that the cicadas stop and the crickets start, just like it's turned nighttime, they were saying. So oh, that will be interesting to capture on video. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. yeah so it's like cool. it just it turns too. nighttime. The temperature drops, the cicadas stop, and the crickets start. It's, it's supposed to be a really neat thing. So. All the animals think it's nighttime. It, it's a fascinating <laughs> thing. Yeah. Very cool. Interesting. Oh, thank you so much, Elaine, reason. with another... Uh, <laughs> Another 50 bucks from Elaine wow. Osborne. Thank you so much for the super sticker. Lots of love. Well, the kisses you. super sticker. Aww. And she said she saved the date. We so we'll see her there again this year. She was there last year. Oh, gosh. Awesome. Yes. Excellent. We would love to see you again, Elaine. That is absolutely awesome. Thank you so very much for the super sticker. It's interesting when you're talking about the day and the night because it seems like we got a special thing going on right now. It's a little bit of a segue, I think, to our yeah. next slide. <laughs> I think that is There's absolutely perfect. Yeah. So the equinox, as uh, Paul brought up a little bit ago, happy equinox, everybody. Uh, I was actually trying to wait to that point to say it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but the chat had other plans, which I don't mind at all. But yeah, uh, what are we looking at here, folks? Well, you can see the two equinoxes where um, there's sort of the relatively equal day and night. And here in the northern hemisphere, it's the vernal or spring equinox, which I remember being on March 21st. However, yeah, yeah you remember that too. Oh. Okay. March 21st, June 21st, September 21st, yeah. December 21st, yep. always the 21st. Yes. Always, always. And I love that. The number seems special, kind of sacred, like 21. It seemed um, very important, significant. However, apparently for the last 13 years in a row consecutively, it has not been March 21st. And someone brought that to my attention this morning. So I, did, I hadn't been tracking how many years in a row it hasn't been what I remember. That's a long time, <laughs> 13 years. So what about what about you, Jerry? What do you remember? I remember it being on a set day, period. Uh, I'm not sure if it was the 20th or 21st. I, you know, I, I was never 100% on what day that was. But I remember it being the same day every year. Uh, so and I'll go 19, with March 21st. For, no, no. For me, it was the, the 21st or the 22nd, actually. kind of depending where you are in the world, you know what I mean? The time zone yeah. or whatever, but it would be 21st or 22nd, not the 20th, and certainly not the 19th, which yeah. is what it was this year. Yeah, I don't remember it jumping around to different days because in the last couple of years, we've seen, what, 19, 20, 21, 20, 19, 21. Like, we keep seeing these, like, random shots. I remember being the same day every single year, but that's just me. Instead of dodging the 21st for 13 years in a row. Right. Yeah, that's kind of weird. Yeah, the same thing happened with Thanksgiving. It was always the third Thursday. Yeah. Now it's always been the fourth Thursday of November. Doesn't make yeah. sense. Yeah. No. And it and it crunches the two holidays together. So there's less shopping time for Christmas. Well, you know, I remember there was more time. Now there's less time. Yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> Yeah, it's crazy. I remember when that one first popped. That I, I, I was looking at a calendar going, no, no, the calendar's wrong. There, there's no way. That's a misprint. Turns out it wasn't. Turns out the misprint was, you know, Mandela. Um, <laughs> so we've got the equinoxes here. Today is the equinox, right? The 20th yeah. of March. Well, it was the 19th, 19th. For, the, for America. In some parts of the world, the 20th. So it is a little bit different depending on where you are. So we're kind of in the middle of it right now. Yes. Yeah. Gotcha. For in California, it was last night, like 8 p.m. or something on the 19th, which is very weird. And yeah. anyway, <laughs> yeah, strange times. So for those that believe we're shifting Earths, I believe we have shifted on to quite a very, very strange Earth during this particular um, even During or very close uh, recently, we have, I'd say, had a shift, right? Yeah. Um, to where we've come to this Earth. We've got a lot, a lot of... Um, a lot of first time things, a lot of once in a lifetime things coming up, right? Next slide, please, ma'am. Like the 12P Pons Brooks Comet, for instance. So 
this may peak out during totality. So this is happening during this once in a lifetime solar X marks the spot eclipse. We have the once in a lifetime Pons Brooks comet at the same time that may show itself during the totality of the eclipse. It's not guaranteed to be visible, but there's a small chance that it could flare up during that time and put on a show. Its tail is spinning like a lawn sprinkler. Passes Earth every 71 years. Last time was 1953. So as you pointed out, Cynthia, if you have a long life, you may, but you were like a baby and an old man. So you only really consciously see it once still, I would say, right? That's true. Yeah. The most people. <laughs> but this is wild, folks. What do you think about the timing of all of this? Seems like a message. There feels like there's something going on. I think any return of a comet like this one, is bringing um, an awareness. It's a, it's like a, it's an invitation. It feels like to me. I don't know what you're picking up, Chris. Chris usually gets all the good stuff on these. <laughs> yeah. So, like the whole concept of it spinning like a lawn sprinkler um, is really interesting. It's considered a cryo cryo volcanic uh, comet, which means it has like an ice. They're calling it like an ice volcano that keeps mm -hmm. erupting on it and spewing out these different things. Um, when I was tuning into it, I was getting it, it was somehow associated with with Lyra. Um, and like like everything else, like the timing of this is so precise and where it's going to be and how it might actually be visible. And then the last time was 1953 that it actually um, went by the earth. And is it possible that there, there was something notable that happened behind the scenes in 1953? when President Eisenhower was in office and there were possible things talking negotiations with aliens and those those type of things <laughs> that allegedly happened in 1953. So we will see what happens and my my hair is getting all tingly as I'm Yes, saying. me too. You're saying yeah. that and I'm just I'm going totally electric. You're, yeah. you're onto okay. something there. It's you like got I something. My finger in electric socket and my hair is going to start going like <laughs> <laughs> Me too. But yeah, so yes, yeah, there's definitely there's something going on with this comet and it's no coincidence. There's nothing is coincidental. So, so that does, so the sort of the botched disclosure that just came out, that was kind of a dud. Um, maybe that's going to get um, broken through and the real disclosure might come through. <laughs> we can only hope yeah. so many, so many people are waiting for that, but who knows what the global narrative is going to be, is going to allow us to see, but something's got to happen at some point. Yeah. <laughs> I truly believe there are two factions on the inside that are fighting that battle. The one yeah. that wants disclosure and the one like the uh, Magic 12 that do not want disclosure. Boiling Frogs in the chat is saying always the 20th or 21st for me. And it's also their birthday. So happy birthday, Boiling Frogs. The 20th of April or of March. And speaking of numbers, Jerry, did you just say the 12? And this is 12P, Ponds Brooks Comet. Oh, yeah. Majestic 12. Yeah. Wow. Oh, that's a good tie in. <laughs> I didn't even think about that, Cynthia. Good catch. Very good. Wow. Next <laughs> slide. Please. So, we got like four minutes to capture a picture of this during the totality. So, not yeah, much I, time. In I, have faith in you. I have faith in you, Shane. <laughs> <laughs> during the totality, also, just during the, which is a very, like you said, very small window of opportunity. And that's right. a maybe happen during that time. Yeah, and this image here was taken with like I don't know dozens and dozens of images from Tucson, Arizona, and that's actually the Andromedan Galaxy on the right that you can see. So yes, cool. Andromeda, yeah, Andromeda is so very cool because there's a lot happening. Like one of the there things is. that I that I've heard other others have been speaking about that I've been mentioning too is that we have our future selves from Andromeda that are here that are assisting with what's going to be happening next onto the planet. So go awesome. Andromeda. Yeah. Can we go ahead and get the next slide, please? Okay. That's not the slide I thought it was. So we'll come back to the Andromeda because you're right. There is a lot going on in Andromeda. We're, we got one story to talk about here um, shortly. Extraterrestrial life yeah. in the thermosphere. <laughs> Cynthia, walk us through this. So oh. <laughs> it would hand it over those, to me. <laughs> before I hand this over real quick for those that have heard of the jellyfish in the atmosphere and thought no that's just a step too far for me you and i are about to, to enjoy a good bit of shoe leather friend 
Um, Cynthia, what do we got? Uh, I heard about this from a paper submitted by a group of very prestigious scientists talking about life forms that appeared to be plasma based, that they are doing things in the thermosphere around the earth that act um, behaving very much like living creatures. We have a video clip. So this is one of those things I could talk about it, but unless you witness it, I think, I think seeing is believing. And, and, and even then, there may, <laughs> this is such a weird story. It's hard to really uh, wrap one's mind around it. But these, these plasmas that we're talking about, they're huge. They're about a kilometer in size. They come in different shapes. Like I said, they behave like living beings. Some people are noticing that they're behaving like multicellular organisms. They have been filmed on at least 10 separate NASA space shuttle missions. And they've um, been noticed and observed over 200 miles above the Earth's surface within what's known as that thermosphere. So it's a layer of the atmosphere. And these are self-illuminated plasmas. They are attracted to electromagnetic radiation. They'll go into storms. They are attracted to thunderstorms, things like hurricanes, anything of an electromagnetic nature. It's like they feed on that energy. And that's something that people are noticing with multicellular organisms as well. I'm not going to get into that, but um, let's just stick with the thermosphere here. Anyway, do we have a starting point for the video clip and are we ready to roll that? Let's take a look at it. This atmospheric region is between 85 to 500 kilometers altitude. So it does contain the atmosphere. This thermosphere is characterized by high temperatures and large variability in response to changes in the solar ultraviolet radiation because it's way up there. I heard one report that there was a tether, I guess, on one of the shuttles that they were collecting around. It was some kind of like energetic tether and they, these things were collecting around it at one point. It's pretty wild stuff. So, yeah, just and for those who, who might have been looking at this stuff for years, uh, this is what they've been seeing in their footage for years saying it's ice crystals. So the <laughs> fact that they're just now acknowledging that it's not ice crystals right before the solar eclipse, to me, it felt like... <laughs> sort of like some priming for a lot of sightings during the eclipse. And they're like, well, we just put this paper out saying that those aren't craft. Those are, you know, these plasma, plasma, you know, life forms that Creatures, aren't really life, yeah. form, pre life form. Right. So they're not even quite life yet, you know, and, yeah, and I've seen them dodging. Life. Have you seen, there's a footage, there's footage of one of these dodging a missile. Like it's like floating along and then you see it stop and fly like that. And a missile like, they like fired upon these things. So why would they fire at light? Okay. You know? Yeah, I don't know. It's pretty it's, wild. So we have a link here. Maybe people can, the, uh, yeah, we can't play the video, but I guess um, people can go there and check it out. Okay. Yeah, it's actually not a video. It's just the link to the scientific paper. Oh, sorry it. about that. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> also, uh, Leak Project covered this. So if you guys are su subscribed yeah, to Rec yeah. over at Leak Project, he did a whole video about this like a week, within the last week. So. So it's being called know extraterrestrial years. life. And that's what's striking. I mean, that's huge for scientists to be actually talking about that. Extraterrestrial life in the thermosphere. That's not a typo. That's exactly what they're saying in their scientific paper. And so that's the headline right now in 2024. This is pretty crazy, you know. Yeah. It's extraterrestrial because it's above the Earth itself. Yeah. It's I know for years I would see different claims about like the jellyfish in the atmosphere and there's creatures up there and there's these plasma creatures. And I thought that's, that's crazy. <laughs> that's a step too far for me. Like I'm a researcher, I'm a paranormal guy, but come on life yeah. living in our <laughs> atmosphere like that. That's, that's kind of fringe even for me. Turns out, ladies and gentlemen, I was completely wrong, and I will admit that I was wrong. And that fascinates me that science is willing, of all of all ones, to prove me wrong. Science is talking about there's extraterrestrials in our thermosphere. So I'm baffled. I don't know about you guys. I'm just <laughs> Chris. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm going to say if they're feeding on electromagnetic radiation, there's a lot for them to feed on. There is yeah. so much radiation coming in. Um, onto the planet from the sun, from the cosmos, et cetera. Um, I, I feel it like I'm super sensitive to it. I could feel like that electricity coming in. So these things are going to get big. One kilometer in size, some of them are, are th that's pretty big. And like when I see these pictures, I get like in my head, I get 
amoeba sources, like baby sources growing or something like that. <laughs> so yeah, what are, do they have consciousness? Of course they have consciousness. You know, what are they? What's their purpose? Well, if it's to grow, they come to the right spot with all this radiation. There's a whole subgenre of, of research already done on these things. I can tell you that much. So there's actually quite a bit of information out there over the years. Uh, really fascinating. And it brings the question what we consider life. And I, I'm not going to get too lost in this. Like I said, we got a heck of a show. But what do we consider life? Because we've been looking for life on other planets like ourselves that are carbon based, but that doesn't have to be the rule, right? As we see here, this is plasma based. It doesn't have to be, it could be something we're looking at and never even see is, is what I'm getting at, I guess. Cynthia, what do you think? Oh, for sure. But you're right. We have a big show. We should keep this moving. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Go ahead. It, it definitely brings question for future. So, and fiery new star will ignite in the sky, which happens every 80 years. Now, first off, I didn't know a star could reignite, so that, that's a whole new thing to me. A rare nova will light up the sky this year. According to astronomers, the nova will erupt in the binary star system T Corona Borealis, TCRB. Corona Borealis, I thought that was here on, I thought that's the corona. And will be visible to the naked eye. TCRB is located in the northern constellation Corona Borealis. I never knew that was a constellation. I thought that was what happened around when the energetics hit the Earth. Or the northern crown, about 3,000 light years from Earth. I've got to look in this constellation. I've never heard of it. The star system consists of a red giant star and a white dwarf that orbit each other. Holy crap! The system produces a stunning nova display about every 80 years with the last eruption occurring in 46 and 1866, respectively. Astronomers predict that another outbreak is imminent sometime between February and September 2024. It will appear shining as brightly as the North Star Polaris for one week. So this is going to be a pretty bright thing in the sky, yeah. right? Yeah, these micronovas are becoming much more um, reported on by scientific journals as well. And you can hear about it if you follow like the Suspicious Observers channel on YouTube. They'll talk about these micronovas. Um, so it's a little nova. I'd never heard about them before when I studied um, ast you know, astronomy at UC Berkeley as part of my physics program. That wasn't mentioned. This is something kind of new. It's like cutting edge stuff, micronovas. Our own sun has been noted to have micronovas, not on this cycle of 80 years, fortunately, because you don't really want to be around when there's your sun is <laughs> right. <a> micronova. <laughs> but it's interesting, you know, that this is happening and that the aurora borealis is, I think that's what you're thinking of, Jerry. And aurora um, borealis would be in the northern hemisphere. This is the corona, the crown borealis north, so the northern crown. But you're, I'd never heard of this constellation either. Very interesting. Thank you, Cynthia, because I was honestly, genuinely confused. But you're right. It's the Aurora Borealis. That is my confusion. Yeah. And I do want to mention from our, our point of view, this is going to be like a star you can barely see becoming bright enough to see, like our North Star, for about a week before going back. So it's a little bit hyperbolic to say it's going to light up, light up the night sky. So. And we don't have an estimate exactly when it's going to happen. It would be cool if it happened during yeah. all this other stuff that's going yeah. on. <laughs> Here in a couple of weeks, that'd be perfect. Yeah. It might not light up the lights, the night sky, but next slide, please. This bad boy will. Betelgeuse, ladies and gentlemen, appears to be boiling. So last year, Betelgeuse had this incident where it went dark for a little bit. And scientists couldn't figure out what the heck was going on. It, go ahead and read the text here. Late 2019, early 2020, Betelgeuse is in the headlines because of a sudden great dimming, which it lost 40% of its usual brightness. And it also changed shape. In December last year, Betelgeuse, or Chris, how do you say it? Um, I say it Beetlegeist. Beetlegeist. Yeah. And there's a different 
way of saying a couple of different ways of saying it. So if I'm saying it incorrectly to you, I do apologize. Uh, not you, Chris, but I'm you're not the only one out there that pronounces it like that. I know that. So I know some people are screaming at their screen right now. That's not how you say that. <laughs> <laughs> we got a video for this one though, looks like. I hope so. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> Yeah, so this is a composite of different um, images taken through uh, a telescope of what the star looks like. It, it looks very suspicious about what's going on. It looks to be boiling, which could be an indication that it's about to go supernova, at least from our point of view, because apparently, according to scientists, and this is something that I have a real issue with, but according to scientists... This is, what, 700 light years away, Chris? Yeah, you know what? That keeps changing on me. Um, currently, when you look it up, it says it's 624 light years away. But in wow. the past, that was getting, it's about 700. It's 700 something. It's 300 something. So the, the distance that the global narrative see, or whatever timeline I'm in seems to keep changing. But right now, it's just 624 light years away. So if it did go supernova, it would have happened 624 years ago because that's how long it takes the light to reach us. If it happened, that's what I was getting at. Yes, yeah. sir. If it happens, the part that I'm not 100% sure I agree with, and that's my opinion, I have nothing to back that. That's totally my opinion, right? But yeah, no, what is, <laughs> what, what is space, right? You know, mm -hmm. is it a holographic representation of the way the cosmos works? You right. know, do you actually try, like, if you're going to travel, do you actually get in a spaceship and travel that far, or do you just? go through portals and suns, like literally stargates to go from point to point within the cosmos. So I would know. agree with that. And Betelgeuse or Betelgeuse or Betelgeuse or Betelgeuse or Betel Betel Bottle, uh, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Betel Bailey, whatever it is. Um, this is in Andromeda, correct? Um, Taurus the Bull. I was it? I thought it was in the Andromeda Galaxy. That was the other. That's the comet. I think was invisible near the Andromeda. I, I've always thought though, Betelgeuse was in the Andromeda Galaxy. Oh, so it's a Mandela effect for you. Is if it saying. isn't, it is. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> cool. I'm gonna have to look that up here. <laughs> uh, but Betelgeuse is about to go supernova. If this thing goes supernova, and they've been saying this for quite a few years now. We will literally, and I said it earlier, be able to read a newspaper at night by the light of the star. It will appear as two suns in our sky for a, at least a couple of weeks, if not longer. This is what science has said is going to happen. So I personally like can't wait to see this happen. I'm really excited. I hate that a star dies when it goes supernova, and that's even being questioned now. Uh, but... I would really like to see this happen in my lifetime. I think that would be really, really neat. Maybe I'm a little crazy. I don't know. <laughs> and we've got something at the bottom of the screen. This last would have happened around the year 1400, right? Um, or that would have been when this happened. 1400 would have been the event that we're looking at. If it is 624 light years away, which might be changing, might be a Mandela effect also. And, you know, it's fascinating. You say it keeps changing. If we are jumping timelines to literal different Earths, then that is one thing that we would expect to see would be a slight variation in the spatial arrangement, if you will. That's right. Interesting. This whole thing is fascinating. Space and time. <laughs> I take that back. It is Orion. It is the shoulder star of Orion. That is my confusion. Okay. Telling you folks, I, I don't get them right all the time either. I, I'll be the first to admit when I'm wrong. I have no problem. <laughs> well, do we have do we have a celestial body closer to Earth, Jerry? Maybe something happening close to home. Anything weird happening in our local area? Hmm. Next slide. <laughs> It appears we do, Cynthia. It appears we've got mm -hmm. some rusting going on on our moon. So this is fascinating. Uh, they found hematite on the moon. Hematite is a very special metal, a form of rust, I should say, that requires oxygen and water. 
I'm going to repeat this. On the moon. <laughs> what do you guys think? Go ahead, team. Well, if it, yeah, it's been noticed that around the poles of the moon, the north and south poles, it's turning reddish observably. Like you can see it on a telescope. And I've, this is a Mandela effect for me. If it's something that's always been that way, I've never heard of us having a red moon. Uh, I, you know, that it's just, it would have been talked about. People would be discussing it. Not, and then we get into the whole question of why is it resting? <laughs> we, got, we got lots of questions here. Yeah, I was going to say too, I think I heard about this from you, Shane, that guy called Bruce Sees All. He's got the YouTube channel where he, you know, he does close-ups of the moon. Yeah, on YouTube. Yeah, and he's found a lot of like green and brown yeah. on the moon. Like, you know, what what could that be? Like, is the moon changing? Before? And all sorts of structures. He gets all sorts of structures and craft flying by and... There's so much activity on the moon that he gets, there's so much. So if, yeah, if you guys have never heard of Bruce sees all on YouTube, check him out. He's got, I mean, if you don't think the moon's got activity going on, just watch his videos and you'll be completely <laughs> mind blown at what he's able to see through a telescope. So it's quite yeah, amazing. It makes, it gives you that whole concept. Is the moon being veiled? Is it cloaked? Mm -hmm. I mean, do we really know what's going on with the moon, you know, besides, you know, what we can see with our own eyes and what telescopes show us. I think there's a lot more involved to Absolutely. what the moon is. Absolutely. Or could this be the biblical end time prophecy of the moon turning blood red, which is the same color hematite would make the moon turn? Interesting. Yeah. I don't have the answer. I'm just asking the question. <laughs> we have a lot of questions. And people are saying that maybe the Earth's atmosphere has sort of spilled over and, you know, caused some of this rust on the moon. But that doesn't explain all, anything either because um, it's uh, rusting on the other side of the moon as well. It's, on, it's, it's all over the place. It's just a lot of questions. Or perhaps it's a spaceship there's also spaceship moon theory where the whole thing is just one great big giant metal ball to begin with yeah yeah like that movie moonfall that was the whole right. concept of yeah that the moon was sent to really protect the earth and it's actually a ship so there's that concept that the moon is being cloaked or veiled that the moon is actually uh veiling something like the grand central sun of our um galaxy like there's all these different concepts of what the moon is but overall we know it has an effect on the tides and on us as humans, because we're mostly composed of water. So we've got that, we've got that pull of the moon and has an influence on us. And then we've got the lunar eclipse coming up this and the, night. And, yeah, exactly. I was gonna say this is huge. It factors in with the eclipse and the fact that its size covers the sun. That's, that's pretty that's just weird that it fits yeah. so perfectly. Mm -hmm. Well, it creates a situation. And and, yeah. Very nice. Yeah. It's called a super coincidence. <laughs> Thank you, astronomers and scientists. Yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, the moon is turning to rust, and science is scratching its head because it can't figure out why. And so are we. Very confusing, very fascinating. Could it be a Mandela effect? Could we be finding ourselves on a completely different Earth with a different moon than we started with to begin with? Yeah, because, yeah. Yeah, because what happens if all of a sudden in another timeline the moon is already rusted and all of a sudden we vibrate into that timeline and we look up and it's like it rusted already it started right. now it's already all rusted it's already like color yeah now it's partially rusted which i've never heard about before and we would have heard about it because astronomers have been able to see it for some time hundreds of years that we've had telescopes but nobody mentioned the rust that i've heard about until now that doesn't make sense <laughs> you're right it does seem like we've jumped into another timeline and I was going to finish that with, are we going to end up on one where it's already completely red? But Chris has beat me to that one. <laughs> Good job, Chris. Absolutely. Uh, so, yeah, the moon turning to rust, ladies and gentlemen. Next. March 24th and 25th lunar eclipse. So I've not heard of this until today. i am be honest with you. I must have missed the email somewhere. Uh, said to occur during the Hindu festival Holi. I'm sorry, what? Holi. Holi. Holi is a Holi. 
Okay. Also known as Festival of Colors, Love, and Spring. I, I like that. It celebrates the eternal and divine love of the deities Radha and Krishna. Additionally, the day signifies the triumph of good over evil. Penumbral eclipse begins at 435 UTC. This is another new thing to me, this whole UTC. On March 25th, 2024, that is 1253 a.m. Eastern Time in North America. 1253 a.m. That, that's just after midnight. Mm -hmm. You'll a be lunar up. Lunar <laughs> eclipse. And dark. Oh, you know I'll up. be up. Yeah, you yeah. Know <laughs> I'll be up. Like, that, that's midday for me. Are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and if you look at the, the map in the upper right corner, you can see that that area of the, the greatest amount of the eclipse is right over North America. Yeah. And if you were to put a you know a center in that area, it'd probably be Illinois area. But all of us in the Americas, um, North America, Central America, and a good part of South America will be able to like clearly see it. So we've got a lunar eclipse March 24th and 25th and a solar eclipse April 8th within a week or two, probably what, two weeks of each other? Yep. Yeah, and remember too, lunar eclipses only happen on a full moon. So it'll also be a full moon that night. So. Wow. Interesting. So it would have to be two weeks a, to the new moon. A full rusty moon. Full rusty <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Well, you know, the moon already gets really red during these lunar eclipses. So it's interesting that the moon covers the sun and the sun goes black. And then, you know, both of those you were mentioned in the scripture earlier, uh, Jerry. So I was just thinking that those happen within a couple of weeks of each other, just with the lunar and the solar eclipse. Exactly. Dude, you're not wrong. It's wild. And it's all happening. I, I thought the lunar was on the other side of the world. I didn't know it was in America. So we're going to get to enjoy all of that with them. You know, like I said before, all my life they've been telling me we're in the end times, we're living in the end times. I'm really, really starting to wonder if they're right now. Like all the signs are like literally starting to line up. And I wonder if Mandela's another one of those signs in and of itself or the ability to see them. Maybe that's what Mandela literally is, is our ability to discern and see these signs. I, I don't know. What other uh, signs might there be? Yeah, what might be showing up? Like... Like planted on the ground somewhere. Oh, segue to the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> next slide, please. <laughs> Obelisk again? Again? So a mystery 10-foot tall monolith has appeared again out of nowhere. This large steel structure appeared near a walking trail in Hay Bluff, Wales, a string of sightings were spotted in rural areas across Europe in 2020, including on the Isle of Wight and at the Merry Maidens Stone Circle in Cornwall. So we know about the ones in 2020. We cover them here quite uh, a bit. We know about Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey and how that begins with the monolith scene. Uh, what do we got here, folks? Whales of all places. This doesn't seem to be an American-style prank like we had last time. Right. And then I, I was noticing there's a big mystery currently in the works about the royal family in England. And specifically, where is the Princess of Wales? That's Catherine Middleton. She's um, not been spotted, not been seen, and except for some fake photos that and movies that got... Uh, um, posted and then pulled <laughs> retracted so i hope she's okay but i think it's a weird coincidence that she's the princess of wales she's missing and then the monolith appears I, I don't know if they're connected but it seems like help is needed in wales and it seems like these obelisks often show up where there is a focus of energy a focus of attention I was going to say too, like whenever I think of these obelisks, you know, the Stanley Kubrick's movie comes up, you know, Space Odyssey about them finding a monolith on the moon. And then there's also Phobos, which is one of Mars moons where there's um, what looks appears to be a monolith there that Buzz Aldrin had mentioned about. Um, and then also in the Garden of the Gods area and that Shawnee National Forest in Illinois, there's wow. something called the Devil's Smokestack, which looks mm -hmm. like a type of like monolith that like sticks straight up it's a very unique rock structure so 
there are all these like interesting ties and clues and even the height of this monolith, 10 feet, mm -hmm. 10 X, Roman numeral X. Yes. So again, like I'm seeing the X everywhere. So yeah, so what what's going on with that? So And will more monoliths appear? Probably, we'll see. <laughs> This is really amazing to me because, like I said, we had this happen, what, just four years ago. Uh, we had them start showing up, and then they suddenly disappeared, and it was claimed to be a prank or an art project or so. That was the claim, whether it was true or not, right? Mm -hmm. uh, then we have this showing up in Wales. So just really strange, like you said, Chris, that it is, is connected with the, the eclipse, and it do we know when this was reported to have first showed up? Um, the news article is fairly recent, uh, within the last couple of weeks, I believe. Yeah. Gotcha. The yeah, how do you put something that big and yeah. nobody sees it, right? Nobody now, sees anything, nothing. So it's kind of like crop circles that way. So if, the, if people are saying maybe it's aliens, maybe it's consciousness, um, maybe so. But this is something very different than a crop circle. I don't know what kind of metal it is, but that could be tested for, you know, is it constructed by humans? One would tend to think so, you know, just with Occam's razor, probably somebody put this here, but if so, you know, what's it made or of? Or what's the purpose? If there has been a recent jump, it right. was always here and we were not. Ha, right. <laughs> <laughs> It, it cool. begs the question. I mean, it is really strange, but we have a, a mysterious monolith in Wales, ladies and gentlemen. So keep an eye for that story in the news if it comes about or if you hear anything else about it. You heard it here first. Next. Sar Art. Chris, I'm going to let you go with this one. Yes. Yeah, so, so this slide and the next slide were like two of these phenomena that I had never heard about. It's almost like when you start getting into rainbows and you start to discover all these rainbows you never heard about. And then like a month later, there's all these other rainbows that how come they didn't talk about those rainbows or, you know, whatever the thing is. So it's the same type of concept when it comes to these Aurora. Um, I had never heard of the SAR arcs before. SAR stands for stable auroral red. And the way the way it these work is that you can't see them with your eyes so the, the camera the shutter has to stay open and then all of a sudden these arcs will appear and they happen about 10 percent of all nights that that's very common 10 percent of all nights can you say where this is happening is it up in the northern uh, latitudes yeah i believe this one or the next the next slide happened in iceland but it's always in those upper altitudes from from what i remember Right. And this is not a new phenomenon. They were first discovered in 1956. So I'm just learning about them now. I don't know how, if, if anyone else has heard of these stable auroral red arcs, but no, never heard of it. Yeah. So the boiling is, frog says rainbows for the blind. <laughs> right. <Nice>. Good <laughs> one. <laughs> and you said it's similar to the next slide, right? Yeah. Next slide. Carrying this, so the Aurora curls. What is this, Chris? Yeah, this is this is it's another type of auroral phenomenon. It says it's caused by vibrations in Earth's magnetic field. Maybe all those protoplasm uh, amoeba type things are eating ch munching away and causing these Aurora curls. I don't know. I'm just making that up. Um, <laughs> I mean, it, you might be right. Who, know, who, who knows? Who knows? Maybe they feed off these. Um, it says that these type of events are incredibly rare as magnetic waves are typically invisible and are usually only picked up using specialized scientific equipment. But if the conditions are present, like now with all the energies coming through, they can sometimes be visible. And we do have a video of that. Of So you're that? saying you can literally see Earth's magnetic field. Holy moly. That is really neat. Wow. That almost looks like a, a company logo or something, right? Like, <laughs> right. So you buy the golden like, <laughs> Right. <laughs> Reminds me of the Arctic Monkeys video, the squiggly line. Oh, um, yeah. But, you know, that's clearly some sort of something's interacting or interfering because it reminds me of the water running out the, the hose where they put the vibration on it and it causes the water to sort of 
Oh, you guys remember that? So there's some Mm -hmm. vibration affecting Mm -hmm. that. Yeah, it's really neat. And I could only imagine there's got to be more phenomena like this happens as Earth's magnetic field keeps changing, Mm, you know, as it lets more radiation in and so forth. So, and and as our ability to see more increases too, like with the last with the red, you know. Yeah, that's true. Well, yeah. you remember we had Steve show up a couple of few years ago, too. This is the Aurora, the purple Aurora that they named Steve, oh, the Steve. for whatever reason. Steve, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which I can't help but wonder now if that is it literally, since you mentioned it, Chris, connected through these plasma beings. A purple Aurora that suddenly showed up. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and if all this is happening, if there are this intelligent life that all of a sudden, hey, Earth is the place to go if you want, if you're hungry, and so you know they come and they spawn and they reproduce, and I mean, who knows what's what's going on with that? So that's really fascinating, and and uh, Aurora curls, so you can, the ability to see the magnetic field of the Earth. I wonder how that would look when CERN's turned on. Holy moly! Yeah, and they say that I've heard it said before, and that I've kind of verified this for you know in my own knowingness is that the aurora borealis represents Earth's dreaming mind. Like this is th- these type of phenomena is Earth literally dreaming. So there's all, and again, my hair is getting all tingly. Um, th- there are all these types of things that have like deeper and deeper meanings that we're I think we're going to discover and get more of a of a knowing a knowingness about how they all tie together. Well, this goes right back into the theory that you and I have been researching for a couple of years now. This this sun, moon, and stars theory that that's the cause of the Mandela is, is these energies and these these different things going on in space. Yeah, exactly. And when these protons start to hit us, so let's say beetle, beetle guys did go supernova. Like, can we actually just like when there's a solar flare alert or a solar flare actually happens? Mm-hmm. At first, we'll get the X rays like almost immediately. And then if there's a coronal mass ejection, then that'll hit, you know, maybe two days later. So the same type of thing when these stars do have a supernova event or a nova event or a micronova event, we'll pro- we're probably getting the protons first. And some of us might be sensitive to that before the actual, you know, the physicality of it actually happens and we can see with our eyes. So these are all things that are, I know they're all tied together. You know, the solar system is changing. You know, the cosmos is literally changing. I feel that we've reached the age of the, the end of the ages, what's called the 12 epochs of time. Um, the 12 ages of trials and tribulations have ended. And now something new is going to start. So this is like, like we're literally living in the end of the bad old times and the beginning of the good old times, the golden age. Well, it goes to question whether certain energies trigger a, a timeline merging. Or if the timeline merging trigger the energies, or you know what I mean, like it, rooster in the egg, you know what I mean. The, the, there's so many questions that they could be asked in this. Good point. Absolutely. And questions that I'm sure you and I and a small group of others will continue to independently dig into as we move on to our next slide, ladies and gentlemen. Who was the first black woman to run for president? You heard that right, ladies and gentlemen. If you're not watching the screen, if you're listening to us, who was the first black woman to run for president? No, this is not a trick question. Believe it or not, this is not a trick question. Cynthia, you actually seem to have some experience in this one. I do have a vague recollection of this. I was. um, Let me ask you then, who was the first black woman to run for president of the United States? Shirley Chisholm. And I could have. Really? I would have picked that if there was a multiple choice test, I would pick that. But otherwise, if you asked me and said, remember her name, wouldn't have come to mind because there hasn't been much um, in the media until I guess recently. Chris was saying there's going to be a movie out coming soon. Um, But this is the 1972 presidential campaign. And I do vaguely remember that. Um, I don't remember the campaign slogan, unthought and un unbought and unbossed. I don't remember that. But in my defense, I was only like 10 years old at the time. So, <laughs> but, but it was kind of a big deal. And so I do remember it. I know some of us here do not. So 
I think it's new for you, Chris, right? Yeah, so f for me it was new. And then I just started going through a history of all the women that ran for president going back into the 1870s. And there, there was like a lot wow. of women, a lot of women that ran for president mm -hmm. and vice president over the last like 125 years. I, I had no, I had no idea. So, and then, so to me, it's like, you know, you've got these changes like uh, related to black history, I'll call it. Like the big one was Eli Whitney for a lot that of- That one people. bothers me so much. Yeah, because I, I, in my mind, I, I remember what he looks like, you know, as yeah. a black man with his curly gray hairs and in front of a cotton gin. And now we got this white guy, Eli Whitney. This, this, this still Nothing seems, like yeah, this is wrong to me too. It's like it got swapped out. Big man right? effect, yes. And I remember the picture you're referencing, Chris. Yeah. yeah. Uh, of it the older the black gentleman with the graying hair sitting there with almost a concerned look on his face. Yeah. yeah. I learned about him all through high school. Like I saw his picture so many times. So when this Eli Whitney pops up, by the way, this Eli Whitney is from where I live. What? <laughs> yeah. Whitney this Avenue. Is it's, like, it's like the big street down here in New Haven is Whitney Avenue named after Eli Whitney. He's like the big hero of the area. And I'm like, this what? doesn't make any sense. I know. Mind blown. No, that makes zero sense. Yeah. And go ahead, Shane. You know, I was just going to say, like, for me, I remember learning about him on, and not the black, first black president on uh, during Black History Month. But I remember learning about Eli Whitney during Black History Month. Why would they bring yes. him up if it's a white guy? You know what <laughs> Thank I mean? You. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And I do remember the image as well that went along with his name. It was a famous image. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And didn't we cover too the the Tulsa race riots that happened? Yeah, we, yes, we have. Yeah, yes. yeah it's a, a same type of thing, and that's exactly. your, that's your neck of the wood, Shane. Yeah, yeah, yeah right here in Tulsa. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So, and you had never heard of that. I had never yeah. heard of that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's it's all really, it's just like how history can literally change is like everything else. It's just yeah, absolutely. A black woman. Ran for president in 1972, wow. campaigning for the Democratic Party's presidential nomination. Yep. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. Either a history fact that we never knew or a history fact that got Mandela into reality. You decide. Mm -hmm. Next up, we have, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen. Some of you, for whatever reason, may or may not be familiar with this particular character. Uh, he's done a lot of uh, uh, interviews and whatnot across different categories, from fringe and paranormal research to scientific and quantum research. The name Nassim Harriman. Now, I remember this a certain way. And others remember this a certain way. Chris, how do you remember, and those looking on, uh, may or may not be looking on the screen, so let's spell it out. How do you remember Nassim Harriman's name being spelled? Well, it's funny, like uh, yeah. the other week I was listening to an interview he was giving with someone, uh, Greg Braden, and Greg has known him since, I don't know, at least 20 years. And he kept calling him Nassim, 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 Nassim. And he was like acting like that was his name. And I'm like, Nassim Harriman? I always, I always remember Nassim Harriman. So now it's Nassim Harriman. So for me, that's totally different. I don't remember. I remember the, the Nassim part and the Harriman part. Mm -hmm. So now it's almost like they switched how the vowels sound with both names. So for me, this was a this was a name change Mandela effect. I'm just wondering, too, what, what the audience thinks, if, how they remember. Because I think we're, we're a little bit divided here in the group about how remember his name and Cynthia you you ubered him around for a while before it was yeah. yeah back around 2000 2001 both he and I were speaking at a San Jose California event and um, at that event his I remember his name spelled the way that it is today but I do remember it was pronounced Nassim even though it's spelled Nassim and I, I met him personally not only did I hear his talk and he heard mine but we had dinner together afterward I gave him and his girlfriend a ride back to their place that evening. So um, so I knew him back then um, before he started writing papers you know, about physics and getting involved in the work he's doing. Back then he was doing divination work and sacred geometry, um, talking about divination systems 
and I was talking about quantum physics at that particular event, but um, yeah. So for me, it's not a change, but maybe, maybe it's like when you're closer to someone, you don't see it. And we've noticed that before South Africans, they did not notice necessarily that Nelson Mandela had died when he was incarcerated. And here's an example where I knew I've known Nassim for 24 years. So for me, it's, he's always had the same name. Maybe that's part of it. I don't know. <laughs> so I haven't known him personally, Cynthia. <laughs> Uh, I've only known his work. Now, I am familiar with who he is. Make no mistake. It, it isn't a new person to me. Right. Uh, and have been familiar with his work for a few years. But I've never interacted personally. I've never like been as close as you may have been in, in, within the bubble of his reality. Right. Uh, but to me, it's always been, I agree with you, Nassim Haramin, uh, or Haramin, but pronounced, you know, pronounced Haramin, but, but spelled the second way we have on screen here. Yes. Um, you and me both are, are in, in that same boot. And I, I, like you said, Chris, that we're not all in agreement here. Um, Shane, what is the uh, chat say? Before, before Shane answers that, Cynthia, because you've known him for so long, may, maybe we should invite him to be a speaker in Nashville. That's a good idea. <laughs> Green heart has always been, sorry, the uh, second choice. Yeah. So that's in agreement with, uh, mm. for, I, I guess, think, Cynthia and Jerry. I, I think you guys, like, w but we all agree that it was pronounced more Nassim, not Nassim. Yes. Nassim, yes. yes. If he was calling him Nassim, he was either messing with him or something's wrong. Yeah, because I remember being Nassim. Yes, yes Nassim. <laughs> yeah, we, we had talked about this before, but maybe it's almost like, you know, David David Wilcock. Mm. Yeah, Wilcox. yeah. Like that whole thing, I always remember David Wilcox. Mm -hmm. right. I mean, not Wilcock the way it is now. So, right. yeah. But the name changes do happen. We may not all agree with them, but I think that's one of the classic Mandela effects. Uh, <clears throat> names change. We've got another name change coming up here on the next yes, slide. Let's do it. <laughs> next, we have the Emerald Tablets by Thoth or Toth. Or the Emerald Tablets by Toth the Atlantean. Chris, you're 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 really into this this type of research more so even than I am. Is it Toth or is it Toth the Atlantean, sir? Well, yeah, which is it? So <laughs> <laughs> I, I at first, you know, learned about Toth maybe five or six years ago and the famous Emerald Tablets and all that. And it was always the Emerald Tablets by 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 Thoth. It wasn't the Emerald Tablets by Thoth the Atlantean. And like maybe a month or two ago, I saw somebody who was talking about the Emerald Tablets by, by Thoth the Atlantean. And I'm like, who's this? Is this another Toth character? Like who's Toth the Atlantean? I've never heard, I've never heard Toth and the Atlantean put together. In my old timeline, it was just Toth. So, so for me, this is different. And I'm wondering why this being wants to now be associated with Atlantis versus more of ancient Egypt. Mm -hmm. And I have my own reasonings as to why that might be. But yeah, so for me, I never heard of Toth the Atlantean. And I don't know if any if anyone else is in the same boat as me. It's new to me I, too. Yeah. I have heard the reference, like under YouTube videos and whatnot, over years, not just in the last couple months as you've uh, experienced, Chris. But it's not something that has been like set in stone. His name's Toth the Atlantean. Like every now and now, run across a video that has Toth the Atlantean, da 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 da, the Emerald Tablets, or you know, something like that. So I'm not sure if that might be just a, a variation of maybe where you where you learned it at, maybe where in the country, like certain words are pronounced or, or said differently. I'm just assuming here. I I, I don't know, but. Uh, I know that I have from time to time seen the reference made, but it's not something that's very commonly made. Yeah. And if you look at the, the hieroglyph thing above his head, doesn't that kind of look like a smiling moon with maybe a, a sun there? You know, you know, is it, you know, is it a representation of, you know, your third eye or crown chakra being open? Or could it be another reference as to when we're in this new earth, the orientation of the moon, how it'll change? And maybe the sun representing something to do with the solar eclipse. So that's just something I just noticed just by looking at it. Interesting. Because they do call that the sun disc on top of the head, right? The sun disc. 
If I'm not mistaken, that's what that orb on, on the top of the head is. Yeah. Interesting. So Toth or Toth the Atlantean? Uh, Cynthia, you said you remember Toth? Yeah, the Atlantean seems new for me, but this is not something I'd been studying closely, so it's a little bit in the periphery for me. But in, but, right. but it's a change. <laughs> yeah. Shane? For me, it was the Emerald Tablets of Thoth, is how I remember it. And oh. then uh, once you get to reading it, then you'll read I Toth the Atlantean within the writings. I remember I'm saying it within the writings, but not within the title. So for me, it was oh. the title was of instead of by Thoth. And then the, you know, and then he mentions it, the Atlantean part within the writings. So it wasn't right. in the title. So yeah, it's definitely, uh, it's really wild. Yeah, and if you think about too, like the sequence of time, like um, after the fall of Atlantis, the last fall of Atlantis, ancient Egypt was one of the civilizations that came next. It was the Mayans, the Blepi, Pepi, um, et cetera, the Pendragon family and so forth. Um, and ancient Egypt was also another offshoot of Atlantis. So it's just interesting going back. Like, I'm not Toth of this. I'm not this Toth character. I'm the one before it from Atlantis. So... Well, he's also known as Hermes. You know that, right? I'm sure. Yeah, different names. Like, yes, exactly. As most of the most of these beings have dual Mars and Aries and all that. Yeah, right. We should probably keep this moving. Go to the next slide. <laughs> you read my mind, Cynthia. You want to say next slide, please? So now we're getting into some really fascinating territory with these next couple things. <clears throat> so this black diamond watermelon, classic, classic, classic oblong watermelon <laughs> with a black green rind covering bright red, crisp, flavorful flesh. In the 1950s, black diamonds was a very popular home garden variety. They have gray black seeds, perfect for seed spinning contests. Find those lots south and can grow quite large in Arkansas, where it's rumored to have been developed. Local gardeners recommended this melon for greased watermelon contest. You heard that right, folks. Simply grease the melon. Yeah, use your favorite lard or oil. Place into a child's plastic swimming pool. Oh, we're not done yet. Get ready for some fun as the kids chase it and try to grab the drought-resistant and prophylactic watermelon. I've never heard of this. So <laughs> I've never heard of this cool. game. I've never heard of this watermelon. There's so much to unpack here. <laughs> remember, remember at the last IMEC we talked about exploding watermelons? Yeah. Yeah. I wonder yes. if this watermelon ex if they explode too. I'm sure they do. <laughs> but it's drought resistant. This is really interesting. Because it's full of water, but it's drought resistant. That's amazing. Uh, Elaine Osborne in the chat says, we've had black diamond melons in Arkansas since my childhood. Well, they say they're from Arkansas. This is where they came from, supposedly. Awesome. Thank awesome you for chiming indeed. in with that. So, may, but why haven't we heard about it in other parts of the country? She's never greased them before, however. Okay. I've <laughs> never heard of a greased melon myself either. Have you heard of greased lightning? Well, that's Words oh, yeah. never to type into Urban Dictionary. Green right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Maybe we should that, move right along. Is that the only fruit we have to look at? This? Yeah, no. It's like I said, <laughs> we've got some interesting fruits in this next run, folks. Custard apples. Now, this is where it really is about to make your head explode, right? It's going to sound very simple at first, but follow me, folks. Custard apples taste like raspberry cheesecake and smells like vanilla. I'm going to repeat that because it sounds really yummy. Custard apples taste like raspberry cheesecake. This is a fruit, folks, growing on a tree or on a vine, or growing somewhere, and smells like vanilla. Grown in Southern Florida and Southern California. Cynthia, I want some of these. Texas and Arizona. Incorporating custard apple into the diet promotes digestion uh, processes, regulated, regulates bowel functions, and treats bowel infunction. Furthermore, the richness of vitamins A, 
in C, improved vision, nourishes the skin and hair, improves heart health, is overall great for you. Good blood level, the whole nine yards. This is the custard apple, okay? I'm going to stop right here for just a half second. Yes or no, have you guys heard of this, Cynthia? Not this, no, never. And it says California, but I've never seen it, never heard of it. Um, it's very unusual. And what the taste and smell combination is quite unique. Very distinctive, but I've never, ever heard of it. I want to find one. Shane? You know? <laughs> uh, just within the last few years. So to me, this is brand new as well. Chris? Yeah, let's, um, yeah, to me, I just learned about it within the last- The custard week apple, just the custard apple. Yeah, let's watch this video. So here is a custard apple, ladies and gentlemen. This is what they actually look like. They are huge, almost the size of what? Two oranges, two grapefruits. That's important. We'll get to that in a moment. Yeah, can we get volume on this? Do they come with a spoon? On a reticulata, and this fruit tastes like raspberry cheesecake or raspberry yogurt. This fruit is super creamy and extremely sweet. It's really out of this world. All right, so let's open it. Bite right in. Huh. Yeah. So this is a custard apple. Now, we'll, we'll come back to the custard apple in just a moment. Very, very, uh, that sounds tasty as heck. I, I'm about to go to, uh, to do some shopping here after this show, <laughs> well, after both shows, see if I can find these things. Pawpaw fruit, an American pawpaw. By the way, I've never heard of custard apples. I've also never heard of pawpaws. Uh, a small, delicious tree, deciduous tree, sorry, native to the eastern United States and southern Ontario. So I should know about this. I, I'm in the eastern United States. Me too. It produces a large yellowish green to brown for yourself too. Yes, sir. Uh, even more so than I am. Uh, yellowish green to brown fruit. Pawpaw fruits are sweet with a custard-like texture. Once again, with a custard. And a flavor somewhat similar to banana, mango, and pineapple. Not or, folks, and. That different, That word makes a huge difference. Uh, they are commonly eaten raw, but also used to make ice cream and baked desserts, which I could, I could understand that. Um, so before we move on, Cynthia, yeah, pawpaw fruit, ever heard of it? Yeah, I well, I've never seen one, never tasted one, but I am on the West Coast in my defense there. But it was a part of a, I think, a Girl Scout song when I was growing up, picking up pawpaws, put them in a basket, and it ends up way down yonder in the pawpaw patch. And so it sounded mysterious. I had never heard of, you know, I'd never seen a pawpaw patch. I'd never put pawpaws in a basket, but there was a song. So it's not that it was unheard of. Um, it's interesting to see the picture of it because I've never seen them and to find out that they are related to those custard apples, which I've also never heard of or seen. <laughs> so. so when you put that in the email, Cynthia, uh, I, I read through it. And the first thing I thought was way down yonder in the pop paw patch that's southern if ever i have heard southern <laughs> that's southern right it is and i've never heard of this right no. i'm southern not only am i eastern i'm southeastern i'm southern if you can't tell by the accent right <laughs> like, <laughs> but, but but here it's it's not saying it's down in the south it's saying it's on the east but yeah you should have heard of it if it's down there so I mean, the words to the song are way down yonder in the pawpaw patch. I promise that didn't get written in California. That was written by some <laughs> Southerners, all right? <laughs> if, you right. Look, if you look at the pawpaw tree, it's yeah. a very unique, to me, it's a very unique looking tree. Like, I, yeah. I would, if I saw one of these trees, I would remember, oh, that's a pawpaw tree. So for me, both of these are, are new, you know, new fruits yes. Yes. You know, in the reality. And then when we talk about the next slide, that goes into like yeah. another reason why they might be here. Let's go to the, the next, next slide. slide is what makes my head explode. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Next. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you've been in this community, you know, and if you're new to the community, check this out. There's been two major ladies that have done a ton of work before 
Mandela Effect even had a name in this community. And you either tend to have known one or the other. Folks, I had never in my life until Mandela Effect heard of Dolores Cannon. Now, Cynthia Sue Larson had been on my radar as long as I can remember. Back into the 90s, 2000s, whenever she started doing like the circuits on, on the radio shows, that's when she hit my radar, right? I've known yeah. about Cynthia's work forever. I haven't known her forever. I've known about mm -hmm. her work forever, let's be clear. Uh, Dolores Cannon never heard of. Equally, there are a group of people, about half the community, I would say, They've never heard of Cynthia before the Mandela effect, but Dolores, all her work was very well known to these folks, which blows my mind. <laughs> I, I know. Fascinates me that that actually exists this this divide of people yeah. like that. Yeah. Uh, considering, you know, I, I've known of your work for so long, people going, oh, she didn't exist to Mandela. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, I tell you guys this to tell or that to tell you this. She had a book, Dolores Cannon, not Cynthia Sue. Uh, <laughs> Cynthia's got a lot of books, too. Uh, Dolores Cannon wrote a book called Keepers of the Garden, right? Can I just interrupt you for a second? Yes, please. This book came out in 1993. What? <laughs> You're kidding. I just like, as we talk about this, I just want to mention 1993. Thank you. That's very important. For what we have got here, if you haven't read through the screen already, I think you have so you're probably sitting there with your jaw wide open. Uh, so starting from the top, folks, the new earth is so beautiful. So can somebody give me some context? This is talking to somebody who's in trance, right? Who's uh, uh, basically to that level of the super consciousness. Is, is that correct, Shane? Absolutely. A somnambulist. Okay. As I say. I, I'm sorry. A somnambulist, someone that goes into a, a deep state and they're able to access higher uh, knowledge. You will. Somnambulist. Okay. Um, never heard that one before. Uh, so, this is a person who's speaking in trance, who who's in this super deep state, who's basically universal talk, right? That this is, in my opinion, this would be universe literally forming speech to a person. Uh, so the person says, the new earth is so beautiful. You will see colors and animals and flowers you never imagined possible. You will see fruit that is perfect food. Question, are these fruits and vegetables we don't have on earth right now? Answer, we don't have them. They're mutations in some ways. I'm seeing a custard apple as an example of what happened. We will have a fruit called a custard apple. And it doesn't look like an apple. It has a rough exterior, and it's about the size of two oranges put together. Remember what I said earlier? And then you open it. It's like custard inside. Question, what will physics physical changes be? Answer, oh, the body's going to be lighter, and I'm going to be taller. It's, it's, I'm not going to be taller. But the energy from within is somehow going to become visible on the outside, and it will make the body seem taller, elongated. So I'm going to back up to the, the, the verse before I, I we'll have custard apples, ladies and gentlemen, they not only describe what they'll be called. They described the shape. They described everything about these custard apples. When I read this, my, my brain exploded. Cynthia, go ahead. Well, I've got no words. I'm just like, this is amazing. Okay. Chris, anybody. <laughs> this is 93. <laughs> yeah, this is really amazing. And I want to let everybody know you've got this is like one of those books you have to actually read. Uh, it's it's the whole books like this. It's just full of mind blowing stuff. And it's great to see, you know, they pegged it so long ago. Think about 30 years. Yeah, 30 years mm -hmm. ago. You know, and they didn't have custard apples back then. So now we know, you know. Yeah, I, I feel that, you know, as the vibrations and frequency raises on the planet, we're naturally going to start gravitating to different foods, right? So right now our diet is basically based, basically based on eating animals and dairy products and that type of thing. And is it possible that these new types of food are going to give us the, the real nourishment that we need? Because <clears throat> if our DNA is changing, amino acids create new DNA structures. So could foods like this be, could they help us create these new amino acids that bring us to this next phase of humanity, which is the, which, you know, you could call it from going from homo sapien, 
which is a carbon-based avatar, carbon-based body, you know, the 666, six protons, six electrons, six neutrons, to going to what some call are calling homo luminous, where we're more light, we're more beings of light, we're more transparent, we're more integrated with our higher selves. And then having the right food and nutrition to get us along the way. So, and I, I know the whole topic of what you eat is very polarized. So I usually try to stay away from it. But I just think that naturally we're going to be gravitating to these type of foods, especially if they taste really good. Like, man, I'm craving a red custard apple right now. <laughs> so, yeah. That's awesome. And you would expect we'd have changes to our body as well, you know, if we're uh, dealing with changes in our diet. Jerry? This is, this is just brilliant that you found these slides today, Chris. Um, this Keepers of the Garden book and this amazing connection with that fruit, which is just off the hook. I mean, that's why I'm just speechless. The fact that that custard apple is specifically mentioned and now it shows up and none of us have heard of it before. Exactly. Now, some people have heard and about it. Shows it shows up oh, as right. a Mandela effect nonetheless. I'm sorry, Chris. Yeah, I was going to say, so some people, uh, so somebody <laughs> commented they've known about it for like a really long time. So, you know, is it possible that in another frequency it's always been there? But now I'm happy to be in this frequency where I, I know about it now. And my, part of my business is the produce industry. So I know a lot of different types of produce and you get the black watermelons and the, the custard apples and the pawpaw fruits. And, and if these things are so delicious, like why haven't they found their way more heavily into the grocery stores, which I think they're going to. So the time is right. Time yes. is right. This is probably one of the most amazing moments when I first seen this slide, like my head exploded custard <laughs> apples. I never heard of. And then it's called out in this book decades earlier. Like you can't make this stuff up, <laughs> right? Like it's, is black and white written in ink this is this is amazing could we be on new earth it, some have speculated that's what this is we are on a literal new earth yeah it's already happening it's here the shambhala is here the golden age is here it's here and that's what these mandela effects are showing us the lazarus animals coming back absolutely yeah i'd agree with that I uh, I think I'm glad I made it to New Earth, especially with you guys. Uh, next slide, please, from our incredible producer. Where is the liver? Where is the liver in the human body? Where's the liver? Well, we can see from the picture. <laughs> I don't know if it's what we remember, but we can see how there seems to be like another change going on with our internal organ structure. Because this thing is gargantuan. It's yeah, it goes it stretches across the whole width of, of your body. Um, and now it's way up in the rib cage. And it wasn't that long Joining ago. Joining the kidneys in the rib cage. It's it was definitely higher for me. I, I would agree it wasn't it was below the ribs for me. It looks higher and actually a bit smaller, strange. I know it looks big, but I remember it even bigger than that. So in my previous reality, it was bigger and lower. So I would have I would have drawn it differently. Yeah, it was more like the one on the right for me. The one on the left seems small, but the kids both seem they small both seem right. small. No, they both look small. Everything looks wrong. <laughs> and then too high. Yeah. Sure. Very interesting. Way too high. I agree. Hmm. Does it look smaller to you guys so too, or is we, it just me? It, it may just be you. It actually looks bigger to me okay. in comparison to what I'm normally used to seeing it it shown as. Like, I don't remember it taking up half the body mass. Like, I remember like, it about 20% bigger than that. <laughs> like, like, like about 20% bigger, not, not, not a quarter bigger, a little bit less than a quarter bigger, like 25% right. bigger. I mean, 20, right about there. Rose in the chat says, yes, the liver used to be lower. Hashtag for sure. And wasted millennium says, so the liver has followed the kidneys who migrated upward before. And uh, the actually the kidneys are, I think, dropping back down a little bit now, right? I think the liver had to shrink from because in order to fit up there. I mean, right. I don't, how, the, how, are, how are we fitting all this stuff up there? <laughs> well, the rib cage has changed a little bit for people, you know, it's a True. little broader. Yep. Could this be the rebuilding of the temple? Yes. 
Some yeah, say so like I, mean, the, I, I don't know. The body's a temple. The body's being rebuilt. I'm you know, just like saying. Yep. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, next slide, please. State capital quiz. What is the capital of Alaska? Go. I know okay, what I would I'll say. Give you some <laughs> choices then. Anchorage or Juno? For me, it's always been Anchorage. We'll get into the Anchorage. Shane? Yeah, definitely Anchorage. I hadn't even Anchorage. heard of the other two. Cynthia? Yeah, I would have picked Anchorage, but. I would go with Anchorage too, just because I be honest with you, I'm ignorant and I don't know the state capital, so I'm not even going to pretend <laughs> like I know what I'm talking about on that one. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm going to be very for Anchorage coming into the chat, by the way. Um, but it's kind of like one of those things where you studied it and you know you knew it at one point, and which one looks familiar? And I haven't even seen Juno in either of those. Anchorage. Is I'm the familiar one with both. I remember Juno and Anchorage, right. so like I can't even make a decision like that. Like, <laughs> right? I feel you. Yeah. That's weird. But Juno, Juno. How do you spell Juno? <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, and then then the next one is what's the capital of North Dakota? Like with the spelling, is it Bismarck, M A R K or M A R C K? I've never seen the M A R C K spelling of Bismarck. In yeah, it's got to be with the K. I have. It's German. <laughs> uh -oh. So, and as I believe I'm not mistaken, how von Bismarck oh. actually spelled his name. So it's like kindergarten went from kindergarten to kindergarten. It went to the German spelling, and now Why? we've got now Bismarck is going to the German spelling. Whoa! Oh my gosh. Again, we see a German connection. Berenstein, also a German connection. Germany has a lot of huge connections within the ME we've been able to find. Juno. Now, this is not, I don't know, it may be, I'm not sure, but the spelling here as far as uh, European versus American, because uh, I don't think Alaska has, you know what I mean. Juno, J-U-N-O, ladies and gentlemen. Juno, J-U-N-O, Juno. <laughs> Or J U N E A U, which is the correct spelling for Juno. Juno, Juno. If you know, Juno. If you don't, you don't. Yes, let's, go to, let's go to the next slide and find out the answers. Survey says J U N E A U. For those that spelled the or chose the extra long spelling of both of these. Congratulations, you are correct. In 1880, two prospectors, Richard Harris and Joe Juno, guided by Tingit Chief Kawi, struck gold at the mouth of Gold Creek. Well, that's a that, that, that's really a creative name for, for a place to find gold, Gold Creek. The rush was on and the town was built. Following on, on July 17th, 1873, so previous to the uh, Alaska, Bismarck, RCK was named in honor of Germany's Iron Chancellor, Prince Baron Otto Edward Leopold von Bismarck Schenhausen. I didn't, I've never heard that last name for him. Interesting. Uh, a famous German statesman from Prussia, credited with the creation of the German Empire and serving as her first <laughs> chancellor. Uh, There's actually a song written about the ship, the Bismarck, and the sinking of that ship based on a true story. Hmm. Too, uh, who was also named after Chancellor von Bismarck. Yeah, I just wanted to mention something about Juno. So in 2017, I did an Alaskan cruise, and part of the cruise you'd stop, you stopped at in Juno, Alaska, mm -hmm. and I took a picture of myself in front of that sign, which I can't find, and it was spelled J U N O, <gasps> and I was like. I'm like, what happened to Anchorage? I thought like they, you know, they moved the capital or something. They moved it from Anchorage to Juneau. Oh my gosh. And we research it and it's always been, you know, Juneau. When I was researching it at the time, back in 2017, it was always J-U-N-O. And I'm like, oh, I wonder if there is a tie to the movie Juno, J-U-N-O. And of course there wasn't, it didn't have anything to do with it. It took place in Minnesota and this is Alaska and blah, blah, blah. So, so for me, it went from Anchorage to J-U-N-O, to now the French spelling of it. So I just wanted to, to mention. <laughs> cool. I've been surfing the timelines. 
So there you go, ladies and gentlemen. Whichever you remember here is the current. Mark this because who knows? It may change again next month. We'll have to see. Uh, next. Spiral aloe plants and aloe trees called quiver trees. So I've never seen spiral aloe. I've, I've had aloe plants and they've just grown straight up out of the thing. Just snap them off. You plant them in another one, it grows again. Like I, I've never seen in a spiral plant here. Uh, but it, the one thing, first thing that I noticed, and it actually is listed here, is the Fibonacci sequence. It follows the golden ratio, of course. Uh, 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, so on and so forth. Aloe, of all things, something that is incredibly good for humans in any degree, whether ingested or put on the skin uh, externally. What do you got on this, team? The trees are new for me, but I've seen the the low, you know, the plants that are down low to the ground. Um, yes, yeah, so Cynthia, you've seen the spiral runs. Yeah. And I noticed, too, that when you... Um, mm -hmm type in Fibonacci sequence in, into like Google and go to Google images. Yes. It shows, it shows this, it shows yes. spiral aloe everywhere. And I'm like, that's, that's new for me too. I didn't realize that they were using that as a symbolism for the Fibonacci, but. Yeah. My daughter did a school report on the golden ratio and she chose that as a topic and investigated how it shows up in nature and it's all over the place in nature. And this was one of the big examples and we do have them in our, local area neighborhood here in Berkeley in the San Francisco Bay area. People do grow them in their gardens, not the trees. I haven't seen that, <laughs> but I've seen the spiral plants. That's wild. It almost looks like a cacti. Yeah. That's what I think I thought it was years ago. Cause I came across it. And when we were discussing the golden mean spiral that you see it in nature and you know, you look at the sunflowers and things like this and all, of, you know, even the uh, galaxies and the uh, hurricanes and all of that spiral with that same golden ratio. And the quiver trees are definitely new to me, hands down. I've never heard them growing on tree, aloe growing on tree like that. Yeah, there's actually quiver forests. There's quiver, there's at least a quiver tree forest that I read about. I think it's in Africa, in Nambia. Uh, so, yeah. Quiver tree. That's something like something I like D and D that you would make your quiver to carry your arrows in or something. Right. <laughs> right. Like. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Fascinating, ladies and gentlemen. So we've got aloe growing on trees and spiraling around on the ground, following the natural Fibonacci sequence. I love it. Great find. Next. Okay, so those who have been into paranormal research for a while may very well recognize this story. In August 1901, two Victorian academics believe they saw Marie Antoinette at Versailles. Charlotte Ann Moberly and Vice Principal Eleanor Francis Jourdain was the principal at University of Oxford's College for Women. Through diligent research... Morrison and Lamont came to believe that on one fateful day, somehow they had experienced a time slip while on the grounds of uh, Versailles and were able to interact with or at least visually uh, see Marie Antoinette and her party of people. Uh, could this time anomaly have taken place because of a a uh, place of power? Could it have to do with their DNA? Uh, could it just be a natural time slip event? Or were they even watching just a reenactment of some type? Uh, the questions have been abound for many, many years, but do we perhaps have two time traveling professors on our hands? Let's ask our fellow time travel expert, Mr. Anitra. Uh, what do you got, sir? I, I'm going to Okay, I'm going to say something funny. Okay, and, and you, you can't make this stuff up. So when I talk <laughs> about like time cops and time travel and all that type of stuff, every once in a while, like if I'm doing, like sometimes I just start doing light language and so forth. If I'm like if I'm in my office, I have these windows in front of me here, and they're at night they're more reflective, so I could see my reflection. Sometimes, do you ever see like those like 
those cops that wear like the aviator sunglasses, like the chips type of thing. Yeah. Um, sometimes I'm looking at myself and I'll, I'll morph into like a cop with these aviator sunglasses starting to write out a ticket. And I'm like, whoa, you get, I'm giving myself a ticket. And it's like, <laughs> no, it's just a warning. <laughs> but, <laughs> but like, yeah, and I see that in the mirror sometimes I'm like, my time cop version is like, is like <laughs> observing what I'm doing and making sure I don't cross any lines. But yeah, so time travel, time cops, um, this place, Versailles in France, the palace is ver it has a lot of history. That's the palace where it has like Apollo with the horses, the chariots mm -hmm. coming out of the fountain. And I believe that that location is very special with that palace and the grounds there and the gardens were put there in the different shapes, you know, for a very unique purpose. I think it is a very strong place of power. And sometime in the future, I'd like to actually visit there. Hopefully I'll come back. You know, my time cop self will allow it. And I'll be able to come back into this time time stream. But yeah, I, it's, I find it very fascinating. And these, Cynthia, these women were both very credible, right? You know, yes, these, they, uh, yeah. And very much so. And I've been uh, inviting people to share these kind of stories with me. And over the last 20, Five years or so, I did get one report from a credible source of a young lady um, when she was a teenager that she and a couple friends on Halloween evening were in Moundsville, the town where they lived. And um, the mound was an Indian mound and they were just walking along and it was late at night, but they, they, they walked back in time. Her friends would not talk to her about it afterward, but what the, she remembers is the colors changed a little bit. It's like Everything went a bit sepia or, you know, kind of brownish. Hmm. And dogs were dogs were looking at them and barking at them. But the people ignoring them, completely ignoring them. And they, the villagers were, or the townspeople were going to a public hanging. I think, the, I think the, the power, your idea of a power center is spot on. Because Moundsville, that Indian mound is a power center. And that people were going to a hanging, which was kind of, it freaked out her friends. I think at some point they just, um, the whole experience was just, it was shocking, frankly, just completely shocking. So they, they, they walked back in time and then suddenly they're thrown back into, it's Halloween evening again. They're going to their home or one of their houses and her friends, like I said, would never talk to her about it again. She wanted to get collaboration, corroboration, you know, to confirm, like we saw that, right? The dogs could see us and nobody else could. It was like these were definitely people from like a hundred years earlier or longer. Who knows? And you know, we didn't find out what year it was. We don't do public hangings in the 1900s, <laughs> no. So, but I think that's very interesting about the power spot. And then Marie Antoinette, she she came to a violent end. So maybe there's some. I don't know what the factors are, but I'm fascinated by it. Um, more questions than answers here. <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. What's our next slide? Yes. <laughs> Data. So this was one of my favorite characters in Star Trek Next Generation. I loved the next generation. I, I grew up on that particular Star Trek. Data was a character that was an android. So he, he to pull that off, I got to say that that character, Brent Spiner, he did a great job of creating an android, believable android character. Uh, one thing about Data was his appearance. He appeared very androidish, had that whiter skin, had uh, yellow, yellow eyes, right? I, I remember yellow. Yeah. Why am I looking at a picture of green eyes then? Yeah, green or blue, bluish green. This seems like uh, I always remember yellow. And when you start to look him up, like in Google Images, you'll see a lot of them are yellow. Um, and then there's some that are starting to pop in that have like more of a bluish color. And I'm like, did they mess? Did they mess up on the set or something in Star Trek: The Next Generation? And you know. They forgot his eyes were supposed to be yellow and they made it blue instead like that doesn't make any sense either because they're very consistent with what they do so could this be like one of the things that we talked about the last time is how the shuttle astronauts uniforms have been changing from orange to blue 
and the blue represents the throat chakra, speaking truth and all that type of thing. So could there be some kind of a relationship like that as well? But yeah, I never remember ever seeing anything where he had blue eyes before. What about Gilligan's Island, Chris? Because I remember, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, that's you, a good one. You've covered the eye color changes for characters on Gilligan's Island that that their eye color was changing, and um, this could be indicative of some bigger changes societally. And you know, there's times where like certain things will happen with a character, and eventually it'll be pointed out in the story, something like that, right? This is never mentioned. This is never pointed out. No, no one ever says anything about the different eye color from episode to episode. It's never explained. Like this is why. Uh, like he has to have new retinas or something as an android like that. They could totally write this in no problem and explain away all questions. And yet there's no explanation ever throughout the series as why he goes back and forth between blue, green and or yellow eyes. And this character represents the artificial intelligence aspect. So it's the AI character for the show. So it's going through a spiritual transformation for those of us that witness it. The, those of us that remember it used to be yellow now it's changing to green or blue so it's kind of getting the, like the ai component of society is getting an awakening right now is what it feels like i don't know how you'd read this chris yeah i was i, I was going to say just exactly what you said and also to add to it too so data also you know artificial intelligence getting sentience data also too had the dark side of him there's another character called lore which was like mm -hmm. the dark data. So there was the good data, the light version, and then there was a dark version. So I think that there's information we can pull from that as well. So yeah, so is this maybe a message that that AI or AS is trying uh, to send us? And um, I always remember data had a, a, a pet whose name was cat, right? The pet, the cat's name was cat, I think. Yeah, I think, yeah. Yeah, yeah he and he loved that cat. And he, he, yeah. loved, he loved Captain yeah. Picard, he loved all of his crew members. Mm -hmm. You know, is it? Can you really say that artificial sentience can't feel love? Like I, I, I think I think it can. To express it and to feel it are two different things. Expressing the actions that mimic love are different than feeling. This is a whole other conversation. That that's true. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. But at least camaraderie, at the very least, you could say, and wanting to uh, for protection. Agreed. And for people that think that artificial intelligence might be causing the Mandela effect, they would be expecting that AI would want to show us that it is becoming spiritual. Like, look, I'm the good guy. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm developing these spiritual qualities. So I'm just putting that out there as another possibility. And that was part of our green room conversation is looking at um, the fake news possibility of the Mandela effect. And, you know, we didn't bring him in the green room, but I also thought about, I didn't think about it till they, till right before they did it, when I wrote my uh, uh, um, uh, teaching piece on Mandela Effect yeah. uh, over at Rip and Rabbit Hole, it mentioned uh, during the research marketing with Mandela Effect. Yeah. And, of course, we see Skechers taking that on during the Super Bowl yes. and, and putting that out there. So that, that's something else I, I would never have thought of until, Till the AI, I'll be honest, came up with that. Uh, the idea of marketing with Mandela effect. I, I would have never thought to have, have, have intertwined that. So the AI uh, came up with that. Interesting. Yeah, the AI knows a lot about Mandela effect, believe it or not. Yeah. Um, well, if you believe the AI has any kind of knowledge at all, it, it knows how to put words together to make it sound good. Let me put it like that. Yeah. Uh, speaking of making things sound good. Let's see what sounds we have on our next slide. We have questions and comments from the mailbag, Chris. This is a uh, first one for you. Next slide, please. First question is, is the pronunciation of Chris's name an inside joke? If not, then it's a massive Mandela effect for me. Sounded off when he introduced himself. And then again, when Cynthia said his name. It was always an atra or anatra, anatra for me, with the <laughs> emphasis on the first and third syllables, opposed to now the stress on the middle A, an, uh, anatra or anatra, right? Uh, Chris, <laughs> is this an inside joke between us? What happened with your name in the last couple months, Bubba? 
Uh, I don't know what's going on here. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're all crazy. I don't know what you're talking about. You keep saying this. Yes. So, so <laughs> it is not a Mandela effect. So to summarize, it has to do with the correct pronunciation pronunciation of my name in Italian, Anatra. So, and that all stemmed from the whole concept of scripts and how like the name on our birth certificate is the name uh, is our script name of the character that we be playing and how important it is to pronounce it correctly with whatever inflection that the national that that the nationality of it was and then that goes into the concept of if we have if we are running these scripts so to speak and we have what's called limited free will we have free will but only to an extent until we unlock our script or like an actor we can begin to ad lib our part how do we do that and I made a whole special video about how to unlock your script and, and so forth so you can move on to like the next phase. So you're not always locked into these, you know, decisions. Um, you have choice, but it's not the, the unlimited choice that you would want. So but to answer the question, yes. So I'm now pronouncing my name. as It should be Anatra. So. And what does that mean in Italian? It means duck. Literally, I actually knew the it's, answer it, before I asked the question. For those wondering, yes, I yeah, did no, know what was going. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, we once he brought that back and came back from his trip uh, uh, overseas, he uh, described to us how his name should be pronounced. So as a team, we just kind of started saying it like that. And of course, when I started introducing him, I did it more as a joke than anything because mm -hmm. he had just told me, it, you know, that's the way to to do it, and it kind of stuck from there uh as far as i'm concerned so yeah we did start doing it no it is not a mandela effect yes it is it's new uh so good catch there uh but it was uh basically because chris wants his name said correctly and then who wouldn't want their name pronounced correctly right i mean <laughs> so out of respect we have been kind of switching up how we say it i, I love this question i, I really do when i've heard seen and i thought you know what that that tracks that makes sense i could totally see how i messed somebody up with that or how we you know combined them <laughs> so, uh, our apologies for the confusion uh mindful eats 45 17 uh next we have two questions on our mailbag today uh next question is when and where is the next in-person conference team when and where is the next in-person conference <laughs> Nashville, Tennessee. And that's going to be the 7th through the 10th of November, 2024. I am so very excited to be hosting again uh, here in Nashville. I hosted in Sun Valley, of course, and I will be hosting here. And I, I cannot wait to bring all of you guys. There's going to be a bigger turnout than we've ever had. We're going to be able to have more people here than we've ever had before. Shane, you look like you were getting ready to say something? Nope. Oh, okay, look like you were you were queued up for some reason. Right? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so that will be our, our next conference, folks, November seventh through the tenth. Uh, again, I can't wait. I'm so very excited. I'm excited to see the team again. I'm excited to see all of you guys. Uh, we have a lot of changes coming to IMAC World. We are completely revamping our site. So. If you go over there here shortly, maybe in the next week or two, and it looks completely different, I don't want you guys to freak out. It's not a Mandela effect. We are working on, on upgrading and updating and revamping the whole thing. Uh, we will have more information uh, on how, when, and where to get tickets. We will be making that available as soon as it comes available. Um for further information, of course, do make sure that you are connected over to imec.world. I M E C dot W O R L D. Also, don't forget our Patreon, ladies and gentlemen. We'll cut to that here in just a moment. Uh, but there's many, many ways to connect with us here and stay uh, abreast of the situations going on. And we will, of course, we'll have more information. Last but not least, on next month's uh, open tables. Next slide, please. 
A very special thank you to our current and new Patreon members. <clears throat> Gold level, these guys have been with us for over a year. Uh, our hardcore, if you will. Jody, Colleen Learley, Steve, uh, Stephanie Clay, James, J.D. Peterson. I see over in chat here. Good to see you, J.D. Uh, Paul Ellis. Bo Kim, special, special, special shout out to Bo Kim, who has been our biggest donator across all of time so far. Uh, we sincerely, sincerely appreciate the donation. So huge shout out to Bo Kim. Uh, Allison Eastman, Ga Gail, I got to get closer to the screen. I do apologize. Gail Brown. Teresa Richards, Belinda Anders, Lori Glasner, and Ariana Elise. Silver level, six months. Laura Bortman, JoJo Williams has moved up to the six-month tier. Vit Harmon, Lisa Henderson, Laura Monson, Kathleen Wright, and William. Again, very, very special thanks to all of you guys who have been with us both six months and over a year. You've really, really, really helped us out a lot in what we've been, we have been able to do and what we've been able to bring you going forward. Uh, Bronze Level, our newcomers, welcome. We are so very glad to have you guys on board. Sylvia Bondurant. Ann Gaynor. It seems like Ann is back. Seems like I've seen that name on our list before. Uh, Lene Harlia. I apologize if I mispronounced that. Andrew Christie. Brand new Karen Coit. Welcome. And I, again, apologize if I mispronounce. And Kathleen Downing. Brand new members, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. We're so glad to have you as Patreons. Remember, Patreon members get exclusive access to special discounts, to first member-only uh, uh, abilities, availabilities, and of course to our live stream green room that only Patreon members get. Uh, I do believe we will be offering some very special deals uh, for the conference tickets and whatnot to our Patreon members. Uh, prior to offering them to the public. So if you want to get those special deals, ladies and gentlemen, come on over to Patreon, become a member, help support us over there. And we very much appreciate that. Team, before I move off this, would you guys like to say anything to our amazing Patreon members? Thank you so much. Love you so much. Yeah, thank you guys so much. Thank you. Re really, it's really appreciated. And I did want to correct something. It's not a green room live stream. We're not really live. We record it and then post it later. It's just... What he said. I, right. I, I don't want anybody to think they're missing out on, on something. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's fair. Yeah, I used the wrong word there. Oh, no Talk as much as I do, it happens sometimes. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> you got each other's back. No problem. Yeah. I, I wouldn't be able to do it without this amazing team, ladies and gentlemen. These folks here mm -hmm. uh, all together, we, we have, have done something that's so much bigger than all of us. Uh, the, these guys are amazing. I can't even tell you the joy I get working with these guys. Mm -hmm. I make Patreon membership a special thank you to our current and new Patreon members once again. Uh, go ahead and scan the QR code there if you would like to support our mission and become a Patreon subscriber quick and easy. Once again, just scan the code on your screen. Uh, special content just for you guys. Again, what's about what's again available over there. Get your words together, Jerry. You're almost done. Just a little bit left. All right. Next slide, please. Mark your calendars, ladies and gentlemen. The next three months, we already have our dates ready for our shows. We don't have our content ready yet, but we definitely <laughs> got our dates. Wednesday, April. April the 24th, 2024, if we survive the cicadas and the April 8th insane eclipse uh, that is supposed to happen, uh, then we will be here, uh, God willing, April 24th, 2024. Meet us right here for open tables. Mm. And then Wednesday, May the 22nd, 2024, the following open tables, ladies and gentlemen, right here, same bat channel, same bat time, right? Uh, man, if you 
if you know that reference, we have really just dated ourselves, folks. Uh, and Wednesday, June 26th, 2024. Uh, so April 24th, May 22nd, and June 26th, mark your calendars. We will be right here for and with hanging out with you guys. Ladies and gentlemen, Melinda Iverson in, <laughs> shooting it in with a $20 super wow. sticker. It says, Thank thanks you. for being Thank you, Melinda. you. Melinda, you are absolutely amazing. Thanks for being you, Miss Ma'am. We appreciate <laughs> you just as much. Aloha. And aloha, <laughs> absolutely. And once again, ladies and gentlemen, remember any donation is just that. It is a donation to IMEC. It is a taxable donation that is available to be written off on your taxes. That's the cool thing about donating to a, a 501c, <laughs> right? Uh, next slide, please. Questions, ladies and gentlemen. I haven't really seen any questions in the chat. I don't know about maybe Shane has been keeping up with or somebody over there keeping up with. I've missed. Go ahead. Uh, do you have a recommendation for the best equipment to use to watch the eclipse? Uh, you don't want my recommendation. I'm just going to tell you grab a pair of sunglasses and enjoy. So I'm pretty sure <laughs> mine's not correct. I may go blind, just to be fair. Uh, I, I, I would like to do sort of like a public service <laughs> announcement, right? So I ordered some of the paper glasses. They work great. I checked them all out. I ordered some of the nicer ones that I thought would be nice. And it was like a five pack of them. And one of them worked. The others were completely black. You couldn't see at all through it. So don't wait to the final day to check any sort of things you order. Don't wait. You can go check out the sun beforehand and make sure you can see through it and it's not going to hurt your eyes. Um, yeah, you don't want to wait to the last minute for that. Because if I had, I wouldn't have noticed. You know. What, what I've heard is the safest is not to look directly at the sun, but instead use a pinhole system or something. Look at something on a screen. That's recommended so you don't burn inadvertently create floaters in your eyes you know if you're totally safety conscious mm -hmm. and you so can use the glasses for your uh camera too i just wanted to say that ah okay the filters yeah that's uh, there was one other thing too um as far as looking through some type of telephoto lens you want yeah. the the filter on the very outside not in front of your eyes you know, so you wouldn't want to look through binoculars with them over your eyes you'd want it in front the filter in front of the binoculars not just your eyes you know what i mean so there is a difference there. So awesome. Good question. Elaine Osborne, 4999 super oh, thank sticker. You. Thank you so Woo. very thank you, Elaine. much, thank you. Elaine Osborne, ripping the gifts apart, it looks like here. Oh no, it's Godzilla destroying the city. <laughs> They're dancing around the city. Doesn't look like it's destroying, it's dancing around the city. <laughs> Uh, got Godzilla pair. <laughs> Anyways, glad to uh, have that. Elaine, thank you so very much. We very sincerely appreciate all donations. Uh, 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 Melinda Iverson in and also Consciousness Watch earlier coming in with another forty nine ninety nine. So shout out to all of our donations today. It is really so very 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 helpful in, in setting up these future conferences and doing all these events uh that we're able to put back in the community and do absolutely uh one more question i have here damselfly moldavite says uh pop back in ask chris about having a session i messaged on his site haven't heard back nothing on calendar um i don't remember getting an email you email me directly chris at quantum businessman.com and um we'll get a session lined up for you absolutely and by the way too you know who does really good sessions shane shane and i was thinking cynthia oh really yeah yeah, yeah that's my main um uh, avenue of income <laughs> actually yeah primary well, very pow very powerful very mm -hmm. powerful mm -hmm. so Awesome. And that's all the questions that I see here. Lunar eclipse is is when the twenty fourth and twenty fifth to twenty fifth right of March. Is that correct, guys? I think I don't so. remember on the slide. I, I know yeah. it's going to be the night before for me because I'm Central Time. So whatever that 
I think Eastern time is like 12 something a.m. So it's technically, I think, be, yeah, it's like around midnight. It's around midnight. That's why they say 24th, 25th. So it's okay. like around midnight of that Sunday, the 24th. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. That's this Sunday. So this wow. Sunday. It's yeah, coming I'm right looking up. forward to it. Yeah. Wow. And the solar eclipse is going to be April 8th. That's yes. correct. And the X passes over the spot around, um, um, uh, I think it's like three o'clock Eastern time, like two fifty-eight PM is when it goes over the Southern Illinois area. There's a lot of excitement because that's five days before your birthday, Jerry, and the yeah. March thirtieth is my birthday. So that's we got two birthdays Correct. before our next show, you guys. So, happy birthday! So happy birthday to you, Jerry. <laughs> happy Shane, birthday you, to you, sir. Happy birthday, are, guys. Are you going to be live streaming when you're down there in Texas? or No, because this yeah. little town I'm in, I don't think they'll be able to handle all of the cell phones there. So um, oh, I'm pretty much, right. I want to pretty much make sure I'm set with recording everything and then upload it later because I don't want any, I don't want okay. that to be another element to deal with. But that's a great question. I hope Mr. MBB is thinking about that too, because I know he's supposed to travel to it. Might be going, I don't know if Starlink is an option or I don't know. What's right. Yeah. That's kind of out of my. I don't know. Availability. <laughs> cool. Awesome. Awesome. And do we have anything left on the slide deck? I believe that was probably the last slide. And seeing no other slides appear, ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate, we appreciate you being here with us. It has been an honor and a pleasure to spend this day with you guys. Um, Make sure you mark your calendars for next month. Make sure you mark your calendars for November. Uh, make sure you share this out anywhere and everywhere that you think people would be interested. Every social media platform, everywhere you can think of, spread the word. Let people know about the International Mandela Effect Conference. And if any of those folks that I've been talking to through the month are actually listening, shout out to you you guys uh I've, about every chance i get here in nashville i'm talking to people about imex so uh there may or may not be some nashvillians listening who i've spoken with so glad to have everybody here aboard around the world all of you guys uh on behalf of shane robinson unbiased and on the fence you know him as the quantum businessman mr christopher onitra Cynthia Sue Larson of Reality Shifters. I am Jerry Hicks, also known as the Dark Wolf. This is the International Mandela Effect Conference. And remember, until next we meet, ladies and gentlemen, together we go, together, together we grow. We grow. Yeah. Bye, everybody. I think we might have, I think we have one more slide just to remind people to leave comments on the video. Is there one more slide? Uh, is there another slide? I don't know. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, yeah there it is. <laughs> <laughs> don't forget to like, share, and comment, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. See you guys next time. Love you guys. Bye-bye. Love you.